Good morning, everybody. If you take your seats, thank you so much for being here on a Friday. Um, I want to begin by a few introductions. Um, representing our Board of Trustees is Pearl Chang. Pearl, thank you so much for being here. And uh, of our Vice Chancellor group, we've got Joe Moreau from Technology. Doreen Novotny, who needs no introduction. And Kevin McElroy is with us in spirit, and he's at home with the flu, and we thought, you keep your germs at home. We're, we're much happier with that. And of course, President Twee T. Wynn of Foothill, thank you so much. And I know President Brian Murphy is on his way. I can attest to the traffic coming from San Francisco. Um, I also want to introduce Nani Jackins Park, who will be one of our um, facilitators today. And Nani, where are you? Because I've got there. Okay, Pat's Pat's pointing to Nani in the back somewhere. Okay, you'll get to see Nani. Um, I also want to do some acknowledgments. There are so many people who have helped put um, today together, and you know, isn't that just the way this work works? Um, first of all, Doreen, thank you so much. And I'm going to ask you all to stand so that you can be acknowledged. Doreen, if you would stand. I so appreciate your recommendation for Tim. Pat Hyland, please stand. You've done so much work behind the scenes. Marty Kahn, where are you doing the um, streaming? And the other folks I want to acknowledge are Veronica Neal. Where's Veronica? Stay standing, because I want, I want this group up. Elaine Quo, Myra Cruz, Marissa Spatafor, Kalia Harris, Mary Kay Anglin, Becky Bartendale, Paula Norcell, Lori Rank, Tina Wu, and Kay Thornton and Brian Murphy, who also ran one of the book circles. Thank you so much for that, Brian. And anybody else who was part of the book circles or any other parts of the district, would you just please stand so we can thank you too in case I didn't have your name. Thank you so much for doing this. That is just great. So. I have the privilege of introducing Tim Wise, and what I decided to do, you've had a chance to look at his website and to read his book and to talk about it. So instead of introducing Tim to you, I want to introduce you to Tim. So Tim, some of us have worked for decades on behalf of equity, and some are just starting the journey. Some have said that you stated the obvious in your book. And some have said, thank goodness he wrote this book because it was not obvious. Some have expressed equity fatigue. And some have said, boy, am I renewed with some energy around this work. We're a community that is as diverse as the students we represent but we are not nearly as representative of them in our population as we want to be. We are mindful of the two Silicon Valleys that we serve, one of immense wealth and one that is in the shadows and is marginalized and is underserved, and 59% of Latino households are living in poverty. And we need to know how do we engage the wealth of this valley to serve those who are in poverty. We are a community that is passionate, that is courageous, that is persistent, and we are impatient for progress. Your voice is one of many that will inform our actions. Welcome to Foothill de Anza. Thank you very much. So first of all, uh, everybody okay this morning? You good? You in a good mood? You're in a good place? Well, that helps because we're going to talk about some things that could leave you in a decidedly not so great place if you're not starting off in the right framework. And I want to make sure everyone's 
of course, you know, if you're doing well and you're not when I'm done, then it's obviously my fault. So maybe I shouldn't have asked the question and maybe shouldn't have set the standard so high. It would have been better if you'd said, oh, I'm sort of doing crummy because then uh, whatever I do, you know, it won't really be on me. It'll be on whatever you walked in the door with. Um, but I'll take it. Whatever happens, happens. I appreciate the introduction. I have a lot of gratitude for the folks here at the administrative team who are here. I have to tell you, the last couple of weeks I've been back and forth. I live in Tennessee, but I've been uh, back and forth to your general vicinity uh, quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. I was at Mission, I was at San Jose City College, and now I'm here. And at each of those institutions, really interestingly, and I think it's worth noting, um, and I think it's a valuable sort of reflection on these institutions and what it means to be a leader at a community college that in those three places that I've just been in the last couple of weeks, all of which take pride in serving the community in ways that occasionally other colleges and universities don't necessarily focus upon, um, that the presidents have been there, that chancellors have been there, that administrative leadership teams have been in the room. And I, I want to tell you how valuable that is because I've been at this for more than a minute. And in the 23 or 24 years, that I have been speaking to different institutions around issues of equity and racism and injustice before last week, or whenever it was I came to mission, that was the first of the three, before that event, I told them that I could probably count on two hands and maybe a foot, right? How many times out of 1,500 presentations I had had an actual president of an institution in the room, right? And I could count on far fewer than that, a couple of fingers, the times that I'd had a chancellor in the room or really any extensive level of true senior leadership. So the fact that that's happening here in this area in community colleges tells me something about the intentionality of the people at the top and that matters. So don't take it for granted and I, I hope you know that. And there's part of me that doesn't even want to say that because like you're supposed to be in the room. Right? Let me say that too. Like you're supposed to be here. So it's sort of like applauding someone for being a good parent. Like you're supposed to be a good parent. You know, like I didn't hit my kid today. Woo great, you know. I mean, you're sort of supposed to show up, but I'm just telling you that having done this for nearly a quarter century and hardly ever seeing such folks show up, it is a pleasant shift uh, in the way that the work is getting done, not always having to sort of pull teeth and hold folks' hands because folks are right there in the room willing to grapple and, and struggle with some really important stuff. So again, I think that's important and I want to make sure you don't take it for granted. I certainly do not. Um, now here's the thing. Those who have followed my work, and I know some or most of you, I don't know, some of you have read uh, at least one of my books and you know maybe you've made the really horrible life-altering mistake of following me on social media. Not a good move. Um, I want to tell you that uh, I'm not known for my optimism. Right? I mean, I'm not cynical, but I'm not known for my optimism about the problems facing the country when it comes to race. Having said that, because I have two teenage girls, um, and you can uh, offer up a prayer or light a candle for me later uh, over that, I am trying to tease out some optimism right, from a general uh, storm cloud of not so good stuff that I see happening in the country. And it's not easy to do. I'm not even sure I've convinced myself of what I'm about to tell you. So I'm just warning you ahead of time. If you don't buy it, don't worry. I'm not sure I buy it. But I'm trying. And I think it's good to try to be optimistic, to try to have some hope, to try to find something positive, even in a moment that might seem a little bit uh, nerve wracking and, and daunting for us, those who do this work. Here's the silver lining. Again, don't know if I buy it. Not sure you will. But here it comes. Low expectations, that's what I'm setting here, low, low expectations. For the last eight years, it seems as though my job and the job of others of us who talk about racial equity and issues of racism and discrimination and all of this stuff have had to spend the better part of that eight years right, during the presidency of Barack Obama simply trying to convince people that this was an issue to have anymore, a discussion about. right? For eight years, we've had to actually convince, particularly white Americans, that we actually needed to have this talk because so many white folks were convinced that the conversation was passe, right? That we no longer had to have it, that it was such a 2007 conversation because, you know, man of color wins the presidency. How could racism still be a problem, right? Which is, of course, not the kind of question we asked 
when Margaret Thatcher became the head of state in Great Britain. We didn't say, is sexism gone now? I guess there's no more sexism in the UK. Or when Benazir Bhutto became the head of state in Pakistan, twice, not once, twice, in Pakistan, a woman head of state. Nobody said, well, I guess the patriarchy has been smashed in Pakistan. No one said that about India or Israel or Germany or Ireland or the Philippines, all of which have had female heads of state. We have still not. I don't think any woman in the room believes that sexism has been eradicated in those places, and I'm hoping the men know better as well. Right? But the point is, we wouldn't say that about those places when it comes to sexism and the opportunities that women do or don't have. But in our own country, for eight years, that was a constant. Right? And that was exhausting right? to try to prove that the elevation of one individual to a pinnacle of power didn't mean anything about another hundred million people of color and all in the country at least not necessarily so. So if there is any good news about the moment that we're facing right now, this is it. I no longer got to prove much, right? Because all of that simplistic colorblind denial, you now get hit in the face with the reality, right? That we're living in a very different moment. We have seen an uptick in overt racial hostility. We've seen all these videos that have gone viral of Folks melting, like the guy in the Starbucks, you saw this one, right? This guy that got bad service at a Starbucks. Imagine that, bad, bad service, slow latte, right? And decided to go off on the black woman that was serving him his latte, right? Calling her racial slurs, telling her for some reason that he supported Trump, so there. Like, I don't even know what the relevance of that is, but he just wanted to make sure that she knew it, right? And this was like days after the election, right? And he felt he was being oppressed as a white man because he got the latte slow. Listen, here's, if you learn nothing else today, write this down. If you think slow latte service at the Starbucks is oppression, you clearly have never faced oppression. That, I can assure you. And yet this guy just went ballistic. There was another woman in the Michaels, you know, and they offered her, she had like a big order and it wouldn't fit in the plastic bags. And they said, you want one of these like reusable bags? It's like a buck, you know, and you can use it the next time you come. And then she goes ballistic calls the woman a racial slur, says, I voted for Trump. What do you think about that? Once again, like, what is the fragility on display, right? When you, my God, you asked me for a $1 recyclable bag. You're, you're, you are anti-white bigot. That's a reverse discrimination. I mean, it's like the most nonsensical stuff, but that's what we're seeing in this particular kind of moment. We have, beyond that, we have talk of mass deportation, wall building, the banning of certain refugees. We have a Department of Justice which is saying that they intend to re-escalate the war on drugs despite a history of that war on drugs being fought in a horribly racially discriminatory fashion. We have them advocating stop and frisk and racial profiling for the entire nation as if that were a legitimate Department of Justice and local law enforcement policy. So as all of this stuff happens, it's a lot easier, I think, I hope, to convince people that perhaps these conversations aren't passe after all. Perhaps we still need to start working at it. But here's the danger, right? So I gave you the silver lining and then here comes the other storm cloud, so womp womp. Um, here's the danger, right? All that stuff I just mentioned, which is so obvious and so blatant in some ways, which you can see playing out on social media, you can see it playing out on mainstream media, you can see it playing out in talk radio, you can see it playing out in our own conversations with colleagues and family and sort of just the acrimony of the moment in general in all possible directions, right? That the danger is that as we focus on those obvious manifestations of hostility and prejudice, right? We miss some of the systemic and the institutional forms of inequality and injustice, the ones that we're implicated in. Because it's easier to point at the guy at the Starbucks, and it's funny to do, and that's why I did it, right? It's easy to point at the guy at the Michaels, it's easy to point at the resurgence of overt white nationalist groups, right, who are growing in number and in influence on social media and have attached themselves to the president, not necessarily the president's fault, but you do have to wonder why they did that and why they're so effusive in their praise for him, right? And as they grow and as those obvious manifestations of hostility increase, we can somehow content ourselves, right, with the idea that, well, you know, that's those people over there. It's not us. You know, they're the bad people and we're on the side of the angels and we're trying to do everything right. But the reality is that racial inequality and injustice most certainly predated this administration it predated the last administration and the administration before that, right? 
Racial inequity isn't the fault of Donald Trump. It wasn't the fault of Barack Obama. It wasn't the fault of George W. Bush. It wasn't the fault of Bill Clinton or any other president going back many generations. It's been an intergenerational problem in our country that none of us have solved. Democrat, Republican, or anything in between or to the sides of those. So we really don't have the right to be smug. Right? Even before this administration came in, the typical white family in America had 15 times the net worth of the typical black family and 13 times that of the typical Latino family because of intergenerational head starts and opportunities that were afforded to some and not others. That's not on Donald Trump. That's not on Barack Obama. That's not on Republicans or Democrats, liberals, conservatives, or moderates. It's on all of us because we live in that society and none of us have really been able to fix it yet. The fact that African Americans with a college degree are almost twice as likely as whites with a degree to be unemployed, which is true, by the way, right? That was in existence before Donald Trump. The fact that Latinos with a degree are 50% more likely than whites with a degree to be unemployed, that was true before Donald Trump, still true now, right? The fact that Asian American and Pacific Islanders with a degree 23% more likely than whites with a degree to be unemployed, that was true before Trump. Our indigenous Native American brothers and sisters with a degree, two-thirds more likely than whites with a degree to be unemployed. That was all true before Trump. So we've all been living with that. And to sort of point at others and say, well, you're to blame. Why didn't you fix that? That's on us too, right? We live in this society. We haven't demanded enough of our politicians. And we haven't necessarily done enough in our own institutions to fix some of those things, unequal educational outcomes, unequal treatment in the justice system, all of these things that are very real and can certainly be made worse or better by any given political administration, nonetheless predate them. And so we have to stop, I think, first and foremost with the idea that over here on this side are the people we don't like, whether for political reasons, ideological reasons, racial reasons, ethnic reasons, cultural reasons, religious reasons, and then over here are the people we do like, and somehow these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. Because the reality is, sometimes we're the bad guys too when we don't see the way that our own actions or inactions inadvertently can contribute to the problem. We look at history, and I think we tend to teach history as the cumulative effect of things people do. But remember, history is also the cumulative effect of things people don't do. Roads not taken, actions not initiated, right? The things that we don't do can be every bit as important as the stuff we do. And so let's think about that as it relates to equity, both in general and more specifically within the educational environment where you work. Let's talk about what the barriers to that are. Because see, sometimes I think we come into these events and we're looking for a very specific set of one through 10, like here are the sort of operationals and we use this dead language of American business speak, right? Give us the, give us the deliverables, give us the operational, you know, this, this is not real language. Th these are not real words, right? We're looking for the one through 10, we want the PowerPoint presentation, just tell me what to do and I'll plug it in, right? But it's never that easy. And the reason it's never that easy is that we're starting a lot of times with faulty premises as we move forward, trying to come up with concrete one through 10. If our premises are faulty, right, beneath which we're creating that one through 10 or that one through five or that 20 point plan or whatever it is, if our premises are faulty, those faulty premises will preclude adequate solutions to complex problems. Let me tell you what I think those premises are that we need to be challenging every day within our spaces, within our institutions, within our own lives. And these, again, will be to some, just like those who felt that what I wrote about in the book was very obvious and basic and common sense, it will be that again to some. For others, it may not be, right? All that tells me is that some folks have been on this a little bit longer than others. And what it also tells me is that, in general, folks of color, who usually are the ones who know so much of what it is I'm saying, have known it because they've lived it, right? Part of it, and this is the first faulty premise, is the fact that those of us in the dominant group Right, are usually convinced that the problem isn't really as big as people of color make it. That's our first flawed premise. Right? And it's not just that white folks do that vis-a-vis -vis people of color. I think men do that with regard to sexism. I think those of us who are straight or cisgendered do that with regard to heterosexism and transphobia. Those with money certainly do that with regard to those who struggle, right? If you're a working class white person historically, you know how rich folks don't understand whatever it is you've experienced. Right? People who are able-bodied and don't face the barriers of disability and discrimination on that basis generally 
don't see what people who do face those obstacles who were disabled face. This is all, again, common sense, but if it were as common as I'm claiming it to be now, we wouldn't have to have these conversations because we would just be listening to people when they tell us they face this stuff, right? And then we'd be acting on the basis of their recommendations, not looking for the white guy to give you the one through 10. See, that's ironic, right? Because there are plenty of folks of color that say this stuff on the daily that we ignore. And yet we do, we've always ignored it. And I'm not just trying to be mean like, you know, I know people get this really twisted and sometimes people think, oh my God, he's, he doesn't like white people. He's so, he's anti-white. Look, I, I love white people, all right, love. I'm white. I, I have a healthy ego development. I do, really. And, and my wife is white, I love her. I just talked to her right before the event. I called her, I called her and I told her how much I loved her, right? Um, our daughters, they're white, which is what happens when white people make babies. That's how they come out. Um, love them. My mom, nice white lady. Love her. Absolutely love her. My dad, uh, we don't get along, but it's not because he's white. It's about some other stuff and we don't have time and, and you're not therapists. So, uh, I mean, some of you might be, but you're not on the clock. So, um, so you understand, like, it's not about white people. It's about the problem that we live in a society that really allows those of us who are white to be oblivious to people of color's reality. So much so that you can go back 50 some odd years. Let's put aside politics for a second and we can put aside ideology. In fact, we can even put aside what you do or don't think about how persistent this problem is right now, right? Once we're done, we're gonna do a survey and you're gonna get a chance to let us all know how much of a problem you think or don't think it is at this institution or throughout the system. But putting that aside for a second, let's just think about what it means that 50 plus years ago, 1963, so 54 years now, right? Over a half century when the Gallup organization, which at that time was the premier and still is one of the premier polling institutions in the country, went out and asked white Americans, a large cross sampling of white Americans, do you believe that black folks are treated equally in your community in regard to housing, education, and employment? They didn't ask about other groups of color because this was prior to the immigration restrictions being lifted in 65, so the dynamic was overwhelmingly white black one at the time. Do you think blacks are treated equally? Now, this is 1963, y'all. This is not a hard question, right? And in retrospect, everyone in here knows the answer to that question. And you know it no matter what your politics are, no matter whether you're on the right, the left, or somewhere in between. You all know, I hope, I suspect, that the answer is, well, of course they weren't being treated equally. It was before the Civil Rights Act, for God's sake. It was the height of the Civil Rights Movement, right? It was before the Voting Rights Act. It was before the Fair Housing Act was passed. In 1968, we were still a formal system of white supremacy in those days. So whatever you think we may have accomplished since, and of course we've accomplished quite a bit in some regards, you gotta at least admit back then stuff was not so pretty. And yet in 1963, when white folks were asked that question, two out of three perfectly otherwise rational, I'm assuming white Americans said, oh sure, they're treated just fine. Two out of three. In an election, that'd be a landslide, right? Two out of three people were like, yeah, what's the problem here? in the middle of the civil rights struggle, right? The year before that, 1962, Gallup asked the same large kind of group of white Americans, not the same people, but another large group of white people, do you think black children have the same chance to get a good education as white children? Now, come on. It's only eight years after the Supreme Court struck down school segregation. You know they hadn't done anything to actually fix inequality in that eight years. The history tells us that. The idea that there was equal educational opportunity in 62 is nonsense. It's delusional, and in retrospect, we all know it, but when they asked the question in 1962, not with 55 years in the rearview mirror to see how ridiculous the answer is, but at the time, 85 out of 100 white folks said, sure, everything's fine. Black children have exactly the same chance to get a good education. Now, what does it tell us that otherwise decent people, because I think most folks are decent folks. I think most people don't want to hurt people. I think most people don't wake up wanting to do harm to people. I think most people are relatively rational, including those folks in those polls, and yet, what does it mean that they could look around and not see what we all see retrospectively and what folks of color knew then, see? Because black and brown folks weren't confused at that time. They, they weren't under the illusion that there was equal opportunity. They asked them the question, and the answers were pretty overwhelmingly in the other direction, yes? so. If people of color could see it and white folks couldn't, but white folks are just as decent, just as rational, just as capable of seeing it, at least internally, what does it mean that they didn't see? What it means is we live in a culture that doesn't require us to know any better. 
right? So if you're white in 1962 or 63, you could be totally ignorant to the way other people are living and the things that they're experiencing, and you still get to be called competent. You still get to get a job. You still get to be a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor or a nurse or a therapist or whatever. It, you get to graduate from high school not knowing nothing about nothing that doesn't involve you. You get to get a college degree not knowing nothing about nothing that doesn't have to do with you. So what I'm trying to suggest to you is if we live in a society that's always allowed the dominant group to remain oblivious, that's a real problem. Because when you're oblivious to the way the world works, you can't fix the problems in that world because you don't see them, right? And this isn't about white folks being bad or ignorant or mean or anything. It's about the fact that we've just always been able to remain oblivious. That's a privilege, isn't it? It's a privilege to not know what other people have to know but it's a dangerous one because then it makes it really hard for us to build connections with other people when we're seeing totally different worlds, right? Sort of like if you ever have seen the movie The Matrix, right? Remember the first Matrix film when Morpheus offers Neo the two pills, the red pill and the blue pill, and he says basically, look, you can take the, the blue pill and you can wake up, the story ends, you can remain oblivious, that's where everybody else is, nobody wants to know the truth of what's going on, right? And if you want to be like that, you can do that. Or I can give you the red pill, you can take that. I'll take you down the rabbit hole, show you how deep it goes, right? And you'll have enlightenment, you'll see what's really going on. And Neo takes the red pill and now he starts to see the stuff that was always happening, but he hadn't seen. That's sort of a perfect metaphor for identity in our country. When you're a member of a dominant group and every one of us in here is a member of at least one, I guarantee it. This isn't just about white folks and it's not just about white men and it's not just about straight white men and it's not just about straight white Christian men. It's also about any of us who were able-bodied, right? Anyone who's straight, anyone who's cisgendered, anyone who's middle class and above, anyone who's got a college education, right? There are lots of different identities where you're the norm and every one of us has got at least one of them. I've never been in a room with anyone that didn't have at least one area where they were the quote unquote norm and that's where it's dangerous. It's that point where you're the norm that you can take things for granted. So the first premise that's faulty is this idea that maybe the problem isn't that big a problem. Trust me when I tell you, those who were the target of inequality and mistreatment and injustice know better than the rest of us what they're experiencing. And so if we're gonna fix the problem, we have to reject the faulty premise and start with a new one. What's the new premise? The targets of oppression and marginality know their lives better than we do, period. If we start with that premise, if we start with that premise, it doesn't mean that every single member of that targeted group will always get it right, right? People make mistakes. People can, can make a mistake in terms of what they discern in a given situation. But the problem is we live in a society where the dominant group looks at the non-dominant or the marginalized group and says, I think y'all are crazy. I think y'all are seeing things. There must be something wrong with you, right? But if white folks got it wrong in 62 and 63, what are the odds that suddenly we're the ones who figured it out? And if, I mean, really, like, like, was there an evolutionary leap in people of European descent that they didn't tell me about? That like, our brains in the last 50 years were like, Psh, now we see stuff, you know? And black and brown folks suddenly lost their power of discernment? That seems highly unlikely to me. So that's the first premise we need to challenge. Here's the second one. The premise that we can solve these problems with colorblind formalism. What do I mean by colorblind formalism? I mean the idea that we just want to treat everyone the same. I'll hear teachers say this. I'll hear administrators say this. I'll hear employers say this. Well, I treat everyone the same. First of all, I don't believe you because the research tells me that's not true. The research tells me that we don't treat everyone the same, that we all have a degree of subconscious perhaps, but nonetheless real bias. And it does affect the way we treat people, whether we realize it or not. If it's subconscious, you might not realize it doesn't mean it's not happening, but that isn't even the bigger point. Even if it were true, it wouldn't be a salutary thing. If you tell me that you treat everyone the same, even if you were telling me the God's honest truth, I would tell you that you weren't doing your job very well because treating everyone the same isn't treating them justly when not everyone faces the same stuff. Right? If certain people are facing obstacles and barriers and mistreatment on the basis of an identity that I don't happen to share and therefore I'm not facing mistreatment on that basis. If you treat me and that person the same, how are you treating us fairly and equitably? You're not. You're treating us equally, but not equitably. There's a big difference, right? If certain folks are trying to run on a track, for instance, and some people have got hurdles that they got to jump over that are higher than the other hurdles that other people got to jump over, and you just put us all on the same clock, and then at the end of it, you go, well, <laughs> this person crossed the finish line first. They're clearly the faster runner. 
and you ignore the fact that the folks who had higher hurdles to jump over by necessity are probably going to be a few steps behind, then how'd you treat people equally or justly? You didn't. You didn't treat them fairly. So we don't want colorblind formalism where we treat everyone the same. We have to speak to the needs that people have. Educators in particular need to think about this. There's been research on this going back many years, right, where they asked students of color versus white students how important it was to regularly get positive feedback from their teachers, from their educators about their ability. Just positive feedback, you know, teachers who, who demonstrated that they believed in them, right? and gave them a chance to do their work and improve their work when it wasn't so good the first time and really spoke to them in a way that conveyed real confidence in their ability to do high quality work. When they asked white students, white students overwhelmingly sort of shrugged it off. They were like, well, you know, I mean, I like positive feedback, but eh, it's not really critical in terms of getting me to do the best work I can do. I'm either gonna do it or I'm not. When they asked students of color the question, the answer was very different. Overwhelmingly, the students of color said that it was critical for them to put their best foot forward because they needed to know that folks believed in them. Now, why might that be? Is that because those folks of color just are weaker? They have weaker constitutions? No, it's because if you're being told by a lot of other forces in the society that we don't believe in you, if you're getting pretty regular messages of incapacity, it might be really helpful to have somebody in a position of authority demonstrate that they do believe in you, right? That can help compensate for the other mess that's going on outside the classroom, outside the school. But if I have a mentality that says, well, I'm just gonna treat everyone exactly the same and I don't give positive feedback, by God, the students either do the work or they don't. What's wrong with them, right? I'm not looking at their actual experience then. I'm not really looking at what some are facing and therefore adjusting. It's not wrong to necessarily treat folks the same, but you gotta treat them the same based on the needs of the most marginal, right? In other words, I'm not saying let's start giving positive feedback to students of color and ignoring white students. <laughs> like I'm not saying like go into the classroom and hey, black person, love your work, you know, and gosh, you're a brilliant Latinx scholar and, and oh, white guy, go away, I don't want to talk to you. I'm not saying that, right? I'm saying you can treat people the same, but you've got to understand the needs of those who are most marginalized. So if we start giving positive feedback to all of our students, if we make it clear and convey the capacity that students have, it might be redundant for the white students. They might not need it, according to their own survey responses, but it isn't going to kill them. And there will be some white students for whom it'll be really helpful, particularly working class, uh, first generation college students, right? Good reason to believe that they could benefit from that. But we know that it's important and necessary for those students of color who are the most marginalized. So if we're gonna have a norm of treating folks the same, let's at least be color conscious about the needs of the most marginal and apply the standards that they require in order to succeed. Right? rather than the ones that the dominant group has always needed, which are sometimes more passive. That's what it means to be color conscious as opposed to color blonde, about giving that positive feedback and realizing that some students on a campus face what we might call the burden of representation, while others face the privilege of belonging, right? The sense that I belong here, right? And for the most part, the folks who have a privilege of belonging or feeling though, as though they belong are the ones who've always been present in those kinds of spaces, right? Even if they're not the majority on a given campus now, right? Even if an institution has become or is seeking a designation, for instance, as an HSI, as a Hispanic serving institution, has a lot of students of color increasingly, nonetheless, that's a relatively recent phenomenon for most of those institutions, right? Historically, that isn't always who was in those spaces. And so even those students of color who come in, let's say to an HSI or even an HBCU sometimes, know that if they're the first one in their family to be in that spot, or maybe the second one in their family to be in that spot, they still gotta hold it down, not only as an individual, but as a representative of a group. Knowing that if they drop the ball, they didn't just drop it for them. They dropped it for everybody looks like them coming after them, right? Whereas for white students, there's that sense that if I fail, I get to fail on my own. That's a big privilege too, isn't it? To know that if I fail, I get to own it. I don't, get, I don't have to worry about it being seen as a group flaw. And if I succeed, I get to own that too, right? And I talk about this a little bit in White Like Me. I told the abbreviated version of the story, but the longer version of the story is still not real long, but I just want to give it to you for those who either forgot it or haven't read it or whatever else, and also give you the expanded version of it. Um, when I started college, I experienced a little bit of what this was. I wasn't a very good student. In fact, my freshman year, I was a really lousy student, just in the sense of not really having my stuff together, not being real organized, right? And so that first year, man, final exams come around first semester and I just screwed up royally. I showed up late to an exam that was like a four hour exam, showed up two hours late, 
right? And then another exam, I totally, like I thought the exam was at one o'clock in the afternoon, so I show up at one and apparently the test was given at 10, you know, so I missed it, right? I walked into the class, I saw all these students sitting around who I hadn't seen all semester, right? And I thought, well, they're not gonna do very well on this, they haven't been in class at all. And they were looking at me like, who the hell's that kid? He hadn't been here in this physics class all year. Physics? I didn't take physics. I thought this was a poli-sci exam. The professor comes in, I'm like, oh my God, I looked at the syllabus apparently for the first time in the semester, which is where I realized that the test was actually at 10 o'clock. So I run hyperventilating to my professor, right? I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. I'm so sorry. I tell him the story, I'm crying, right? And because I know I'm in trouble. Like if I get an incomplete or an F in this particular class, this was gonna be my major. I was gonna have to start over. I was gonna lose my scholarship. Um, I was going to probably have to withdraw from school. Um, and so I pled my case, and he was a good guy. He let me take the test in a room to the side of his office, and I ended up doing fine on the test. And then come back after the winter break, and I'm telling some friends this, right? Telling a couple of black guys who were friends of mine, three, three guys, uh, African-American males, all of whom were better students than me, by the way. Uh, had had better test scores in high school, better grades. They were far more serious students than I was. Um, and I'm telling them this story, right, about, oh, my God, you won't believe what I did, and thank God Professor Davidson let me take the test again, da-da-da-da-da, right? And they're all sort of real quiet as I'm telling them this story, right? They're not saying anything. And I'm, I'm sort of confused, right? And I look, and I'm like, why are you? And they're sort of kicking the ground a little bit and looking up at each other and mumbling under their breath. And I'm like, I asked the one guy, what, what's going on? What, what are y'all thinking? Y'all seem to be thinking something, but I'm not, in on the, I'm not in on what it is, you know? And he says, man, I don't know if I would have done that. And I said, done what? Like, not, not shown up for the test? And he's like, oh no, I sure as hell wouldn't have done that. I, I'm a serious student, Tim. Uh, no, I certainly wouldn't have done that. He's like, no, he said, I don't know that I would have gone and asked for the do-over, right? And then the other two guys were, yeah, yeah, me either, you know? And I said, wait a minute, you're saying you would just take the incomplete, take the F, take the zero, rather than just go and try to, and he's like, I don't know, man. I'm not saying that for sure. Like, I don't ever want to find out what I would do in that situation. So I'm going to try real hard not to. But he said, my point is, I don't know that I would because if I go and ask for the do-over to this white man, he might be the nicest guy ever. And he probably would have let me take it just like he let you take it. I have no reason to assume right now that he's some kind of racist who would not let me where he let you. But, he, but the problem would be if I go and admit that level of error, right, to him, and he has to look me in my black face and see that level of inadequacy and failure. Is he going to take that out on other people that aren't me but look like me? Is it going to remind him of a stereotype that, well, maybe those kids, they don't deserve to be here anyway? Whereas if I do it, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried that Professor Davidson's going to be like, oh, white men, good God. What's wrong with them, right? They can't even read the damn syllabus. Like, he's not going to do, and I know he's not, but this kid, even though he's a better student, right, has to think about that. That's the burden of representation. That's a real thing that students of color face and that working class students of all colors face, and students with disabilities face, uh, women in particularly in programs that are not traditionally uh, uh, dominated by women, those that are traditionally dominated by men. I mean, this is a real thing, this fear of confirming a negative stereotype. And so colorblind formalism can't help us with that. We gotta have a conscious understanding of what people face so that we can actually learn to speak to their needs and to meet their needs, right? We cannot treat everyone the same. There are some students in your institution who will be worried right now about ICE raids, right? Who will be worried right now about immigration and customs enforcement coming to their house because somebody in that house might be undocumented or they may be a dreamer who was brought here at the age of two or three or whatever it is by their parents and they've been productive and helping out and doing things in this society ever since they were a kid but now they're facing potential deportation. That kid is not, and I say kid, not kid, that, that student, that young adult or that non-traditional age adult adult student here at the institution, right, is facing a very different reality. And we have to understand that's going to affect everything from attendance to getting certain work done on time. We have to be understanding of some of the pressures that are happening outside of that classroom, right? Which include things like immigration crackdowns or just the fear that some folks have who were perfectly documented, got all their papers in order, but are looked at on the street as if they aren't and are treated differently on the basis of just their physicality as perhaps being here quote unquote illegally. That's some real stuff. And trying to hold it down educationally or even professionally as a staff member, a faculty member, or anything else, when you're facing those kinds of judgmental pressures can be
quite difficult. So we have to reject colorblind formalism, adopt an attitude that is color and race and ethnicity and culture conscious so we can really meet people's needs because if not, we're not gonna be able to serve. There's a whole lot of research on this in the classroom, for instance, which finds that students who were up against stereotypes and trying really hard to disprove them, right? because they have a real interest in disproving them and knocking them down, right, and debunking them, that that actually creates so much pressure when you're trying to take a test or trying to perform academically that sometimes you end up underperforming precisely because you were trying so hard to disprove the negative stereotype, right? So years ago, these researchers, uh, Claude Steele, who was for a very long time the head of the psych department at Stanford, he's now back there as an emeritus, right, psychology professor, started wondering why it was that students of color were underperforming relative to white students, even when they were really good students and it had a good academic record, but when they would take a high, high pressure test or something, they would underperform. Or why women would underperform relative to men on a math exam, a, a high level math exam. He knew they were just as good, just as capable, but they kept underperforming. So they decided to do these experiments where they took, the first they did women and men. They took women and men who were both good at math, put them in rooms, each room had some men, some women, gave them the same math exam but one group was told, hey, look, this is a test of your math ability. This is gonna tell us you know, how good you are. And uh, so, you know, sort of the way you feel when you take a real test. And the other group was given the same questions. They were just as capable as the other folks over here, given the same questions, but they were told, by the way, this isn't a test of ability. We're not even gonna grade it. It's just like, a, we're just observing the way that people take tests or something, right? Some innocuous, meaningless, no pressure at all. You're not even worried about how you're going to do because they're not going to know how you're going to do. What do you think happens in the room where the pressure was on, real world, the women underperformed, right? Over here, there was no difference at all. Why? Well, this conclusion was that over here, the women were worried about confirming a negative stereotype about women in math because that's a very common stereotype that math are better, men are better at math and science. And women, even women who are great at math and science, know that that stereotype's out there. And they know that if they underperform, they might get viewed as defective because they're women. So when you put the pressure on and in their mind, subconsciously, perhaps they're thinking, God, I don't want to, I don't want to confirm the stereotype. They end up doing worse over here where there's no pressure about the stereotype. It's not even going to be graded. They can relax. They do just as well. They did it with white folks and black folks on a test. They took white and black folks, put them in a room, told them it was a test of verbal ability. The black students underperformed, but the same kind of folks in a room tell them it doesn't mean anything and there's no statistically significant difference in performance. Then they decided to do it in other areas just to see how strong this theory was. They did it with athletics, but they didn't do what you might expect. Like they didn't take a real stereotypical sport and have like white guys play black guys at basketball where all of those stereotypes would kick in, right? As ignorant as they are, lots of people believe those stereotypes. So they didn't do that. What they did is they had them play miniature golf, right? White guys and black guys play in mini golf and in the first group, they told them, this is a test of your natural athletic ability. For real? Have you ever played putt-putt? <laughs> the hell athletic ability is there in putt-putt? Come on, that doesn't require any sports ability per se, but when you tell them that, it triggers a stereotype, doesn't it? In the minds of which group? The white folks. Now the white folks are like, oh my God, I'm playing many years of golf against those naturally athletic black guys and they always lose, right? Then you have the same quality white and black guys play putt-putt, you tell them it's a test of strategic sports intelligence, which again, what the hell is that in regard to mini golf? Like, there's no strategic sports intelligence, it's just a matter of timing, like wait till the elephant's nose moves three inches, then hit the ball. This is not about intellect, but if they prompt that stereotype, now who freaks out? The black guys freak out and they underperform because they're worried that if they don't do well, oh, it's going to trigger that stereotype about intelligence. They've done it with older and younger folks on a test. They took older folks in their 60s, had them take a test against younger folks in their 20s, told them it was a memory exam. Oh, hell, right? <laughs> now the older folks were like, Psh, my God, if I don't do well, they're going to think I have dementia, right? And so they underperform because the extra stress. You put the same kind of folks in the room, give them a test, tell them it's a test of learned wisdom, right? And now the older folks are like, got this, right? And the younger folks are like, oh my God, I'm only 23. I don't know anything compared to my grandma here who I'm taking the test against, right? So the younger folks underperform. What's the point of this in regard to education? It ought to be obvious, right? If you're dealing with students who were up against various stigmas or stereotypes, whether those are stereotypes about English, English language skills 
and whether or not they really understand the language or learning the language or whether they're documented or undocumented and whether they're intelligent or unintelligent, whether they're capable or not, right? And any student of color generally tends to be up against those kinds of stigmas and working class students generally tend to be, then unless you understand that, you might not see what you're getting in the classroom. You might not see what's going on in terms of performance in a given institution, right? The office that looks at those grades and determines whether someone gets to stick around or not, right? Might not understand that there's more going on than just preparation. There's more going on than ability. There's a lot of stuff that certain folks are up against that others are not. If you take a color conscious approach, then we can intervene. There's lots of things we can do. We know the research on stereotype threat, which is what that phenomena is called, right? Says that if you encourage group work more than individual work, right? You have students work together, collaborate on projects, that reduces some of the pressure, right? Because now I don't have to take it all on my own shoulders. So I'm not worried about like if I drop the ball because we're holding the ball, right? So there was a, a guy in the calculus department at Stanford many years ago who figured this out. The black students and the Latino students were doing worse in the calculus lab than the white students and the Asian students, but he knew that they were just as good, just as capable. But he noticed when he observed the way they studied that the black kids and the Latino kids would, would study by themselves. And the white and the Asian kids tended to study in groups. And even though he didn't use the language of stereotype threat, he surmised that maybe that's the problem. The, the, the other kids are studying just as hard, but they're taking all the pressure on themselves. So what he went in, he went in and said, new rule is we all gotta have study groups. Y'all gotta, gotta team up and have partners, right? And three or four people on a team or whatever, and y'all are gonna work together. And as soon as he made that one change, the grades equalized. And the black and Latino students were doing just as well as the white and Asian students. It's the only change he made. Just made one change in the way that the classroom was being managed. That's just one example. There are other examples of things you can do, and you can probably think of some yourselves about the way that institutions can encourage um, a reduction in stereotype threat. Part of it also is the tone that the school sets from the very beginning and that teachers set from the beginning about the ability that students have. I remember going to college and, you know, and granted it was sort of a hoity-toity semi-elite institution, but still, man, lots of schools sort of make it seem like this is going to be really hard. You'll be lucky to even get out of here alive. Right? I, remember the, I remember them saying, like, look to your left, look to your right, in four years, two of you won't be here. Okay, what the hell kind of thing is that to say? Like, first of all, what does that say about your admissions team, right? <laughs> like your admissions team lets in two thirds of the people that aren't even good enough to be here. You, you need to fire the entire admissions team. Like they should be better at their jobs than that, right? We don't wanna say to people that you'll be lucky to get, we wanna say to people that you, A, you deserve to be here, B, you're capable of succeeding and every one of you is. And it doesn't mean that everybody will, but we gotta convey that capacity to everybody Right? And because I think a lot of times students come in and they think they don't have the aptitude for certain things. Right? And that's a huge strike against you if you start out with the idea because somebody might have told you that. I remember thinking I didn't have math aptitude. Right? And the reason I was convinced of that was I'd, I'd started off a really good student in math until about fifth grade and then it just all went downhill. Right? So I decided, oh, I guess I just don't have the aptitude for math. And of course, come to find out years later, aptitude is pretty much a myth. Right? For the most part, there are very few true learning disabilities that make it impossible for anyone to learn virtually anything if it is presented to them in the proper way, in a way that connects with them pedagogically, right? But, but, but we get that in our head. You know what the real issue with my fear of math was? And this is true of every single person, I guarantee you in this room, who hates math, isn't good at math, has this a math phobia or whatever, it's because you had crappy math instruction. It's the truth. It's the truth. And if you love math and if you went into math, it's because you had some good math instruction and that made all the difference. I remember, you know, everybody that got turned off to math, it was because at some point you had that teacher in seventh grade or eighth or ninth grade that sat there at the overhead projector, right? And was just mumbling, just mumbling, doing theorems and postulates and never even looked up to see that everybody was sleeping. So then you decide, then you decide you don't have aptitude. And once you decide that you give up. Right? We got to make sure people know aptitude is mythical. Aptitude to learn a language that isn't your language of origin, that's a myth. Babies learn language, right? And they learn it, and you know, it's hard to learn. I mean, you know, you don't experience it as hard. It just sort of miraculously seems to happen. But it shows that we have the capacity for it. Every student needs to know that not only they have the capacity, but that we believe that they have the capacity. One more thing that's a faulty premise. And this is a really hard one for people, but I think it is the linchpin one, and then I'll be done. We'll do the survey and we'll have some conversation. Um, 
I think one of the biggest faulty premises that we operate under within the world of education is the idea that, gosh, you know, the system seems to just be failing certain students and seems to be breaking down and what can we do to make the system work? And that sounds like a great premise, right? If we could just get a little more money for this, a little bit more training for this, right? A little bit more attention to this detail over here, we could fix the system. Let me tell you something, this system isn't broken at all. And that's the horrible thing to come to realize. This system is working exactly as it was intended to work. And I know this is difficult to hear. What I'm trying to suggest to you is that inequality is not a glitch in the machine, it is the machine. And I want you to know that this is true because, not because I say it, but because the whole history of educational theory in this country and practice tells me it's true. Let's go back a little ways. Thomas Jefferson, and, who was uh, obviously one of the quote unquote founding fathers, but he was also considered at the time an educational theorist of some note. Um, he was the founder of the University of Virginia, as you may well know. He was one of the leading educational thinkers of his day. And in Notes on the State of Virginia, one of his most famous writings, he said the following. He said, uh, you know, we need to have compulsory education about six years in every community. Because I guess in 1780, whatever, like six years was good. That's all you needed, right? Six years of compulsory schooling. Now, he only meant that for white people, by the way. Let's just be clear. He didn't mean that, and only really white men. He didn't mean that for white women either. He certainly didn't mean it for black folks. Didn't mean it for anyone who was indigenous. He, you know, he was just talking about white folks. We need six years of compulsory schooling um, so that we can rake a few geniuses from the rubbish. Okay, his words, not mine. So now what was he saying? He was saying in effect that most people are rubbish. And he's again, just talking about white folks. It goes without saying he didn't think much of black people. He owned over 275 of them. Doesn't go with that, we don't have to prove much that he didn't care much about indigenous people. He talked about hunting them until the ends of the earth, as a matter of fact, and exterminating them. So he's just talking about white folks, basically calling most white folks trash, you know, but we're going to rake a few geniuses from the rubbish if we just give them six years and we can separate out who's really smart and who's not. In other words, what he was saying was the purpose of schooling is not to be the great equalizer, which is the myth we operate under now, right? It was actually intended to be an unequalizer. And this is critical for us to start with that premise because if we, I ask a lot of educators and people in higher ed and K through 12, why did they get into it? And they talk about, I think education is the great equalizer, but at what point in our history has it ever functioned that way? If it wasn't even set up that way and you think that's what it's for, you're not paying attention to the machine, right? So if he says, no, the purpose is inequality, I I'll take him at his word, right? Then fast forward, Woodrow Wilson, before he becomes president of the United States, he too was president of Princeton, and he was an educational thinker and theorist, considered very progressive for his day, in spite of the fact he was a horrible, vicious racist, possibly the worst to ever occupy the White House. And he uh, talked about in his days and role as an educator, he said something very similar to Jefferson. He said, you know what we need is one group to prepare themselves for the receipt of a liberal education. That was the term for college education in those days. But what we need is a larger group by necessity to forego that privilege and prepare themselves to perform certain difficult manual tasks, right? In other words, what he was saying was, we don't want everybody to get a degree. We need some folks to do the really hard stuff that the rest of us are too precious and too good and too smart to do. In other words, we still want to rake some geniuses from the rubbish. It's still about inequality. Now, fast forward to the early 2000s. I'm watching television on Sunday, one of those Sunday shows, right? And William Bennett is on. Some of y'all will remember the name. Bill Bennett was the Secretary of uh, Education. He, he was, until recently, the worst Secretary of Education in the history of the country. Uh, he was the Secretary of Education under Reagan, uh, and he was also the drug czar. He didn't do either one of these jobs real well, but he had both of them. Um, and he was on the show, and I don't remember which show it was, Meet the Press or one of those, but at one point, I'm sitting there having my coffee, and they asked Bill Bennett, what's the biggest problem with American education today? Now that's a huge question, right? That's, that's like a big question that requires some contemplation. Like if I'd been the guest on the show and you asked me a big question like that, I'd probably say like, hey, can we go to break and come back in like three minutes and I'll think about it because I don't want to get this wrong. I want to really give it some thought. Of course, Bill Bennett didn't do that. Bill Bennett had an answer, by God, right? He was ready and his answer was, think about this, think about this. He says, the biggest problem in education today is we have too many people going to college. Now, ask yourself, and before you ask yourself this, here's the thing. I'm sitting there, it's early, I'm barely awake. 
And he says, the biggest problem is we got too many people going to college. Now, I tried to give him credit. I shouldn't have done this. I knew better. But I tried to give him credit because you know how sometimes you'll be saying something to somebody and your throat will catch like mid-sentence and you're not done yet. You didn't finish your thought yet. So I thought maybe he was going to continue his thought. Like maybe there was an internal ellipses, you know, the little dot, dot, dot in the middle of his sentence. And what he meant to say was there's too many people going to college, dot, 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 who can't afford it because it's too damn expensive. Like that would have been a really good statement and a true statement. And I would have said, oh, okay, not bad. Or maybe he was going to say too many people are going to college, dot, 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 who aren't adequately prepared because we haven't truly prepared them in our K-12 system. That too would have been a fine statement. But there was no dot, dot, dot. There was no comma, no dash, nothing, just a period at the end of the sentence. And it was then that I'm figuring, well, surely they're going to press him on that. What do you mean too many people? Which ones? Who are we talking about? But they didn't. They let it drop. And so I got to thinking about it because I'm trying to figure out who does he mean, right? Does he mean the rich and mediocre children of rich and mediocre parents who themselves were the children of rich and mediocre parents and generations of rich and mediocre people? Because I've known lots of rich and mediocre people in my time. Most of us have, right? Born on third base, think they hit a triple, right? Got to take over their daddy's real estate portfolio worth $223 million and the mid-1970s when New York property could be bought up for a song and 20 cents and became a billionaire want you to think they're self-made. All right, all right then, right? There have always been rich people that didn't really have to do a lot, and there have always been poor and working class folks of all colors that busted their ass every day, got nothing to show for it. We all know that. We know those people, they're in our families, right? And yet we have this belief in rugged individualism and belief that the talent will rise to the top. And so when he says that, I start thinking about who does he mean? He doesn't mean the rich and mediocre. We know they're going to college. And we know that all those kids in prep school, I've given talks at prep schools. I know there are a lot of inadequate students in prep schools, right? But they're going to get a job and they're going to go to college and they're going to go to business school and they're going to go to law school and they're going to become doctors, right? So he's not talking about too many of them. We know they're going. They're the masters of the universe. They're the presumed geniuses that we're going to rake from the rubbish, who he's talking about, whether he has the guts to say it out loud or not, right? Are the kind of students that this system serves, right? Working class, first generation, lower middle class and middle class students overwhelmingly, disproportionately, and in large numbers, students of color, right? Because those are the ones who were coming into the system in some cases for the first time. The newcomers to higher ed, that's, it's really the mentality of the slave owner, right? It really is. I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but it's the mentality of the slave owner, because what was the slave owner saying? If everybody learns to read, who's going to pick this cotton, right? By the same token, if everybody gets a degree, even if it's an associate's degree, anybody gets a degree, who's going to pick up the garbage? They're going to think they're too good for that. Well, I got news for you. First of all, let's remember, picking up the garbage is one of the most important jobs in the world. Like, if those guys that do my work, if, if those guys that pick up my garbage in my alley every Wednesday don't show up for six weeks, right? We got plague on my block, right? If I don't show up for work for six weeks, life will go on. Nobody will really even know. The guy that sells pharmaceuticals down the road or the stockbroker, he doesn't show up, life will go on. Those guys who make 19.5 a year without many benefits in Nashville, where I live, right? They do one of the most important jobs. Why are we afraid that if they are, have access to higher ed in greater numbers, somehow they're not going to want to do that. Why can't we all do part of that work? Why is it that some of us think that we're above doing some of that physical labor? See, I don't even know where the landfill is, y'all. If they don't show up, I'm screwed, right? I don't know where the recycler is. I don't know where any of that is because I live in a system that doesn't require me to know. So we have a system predicated on inequality. Some will do this kind of work. Some will do this kind of work. And if that's the system we have and you're expecting the educational system to produce equality or equity in an economic system that's about inequality, you're not paying attention to the machine. It's like going to a sausage factory, right? It says sausage factory right on the outside. On the sign, it says sausage factory. And you go to the end of the conveyor belt and you're like, all right, when am I going to get some chicken nuggets? <laughs> Never, because it's not a chicken nugget factory. It's a sausage factory. Read the sign, right? So if we have a system that's about inequality, we can't be shocked when it produces it. What does that mean for those of us in education? It means we have to realize something, that to be an educator, to be an administrator, to be a staffer at an institution of learning, higher learning in particular, is to be a revolutionary or to be a collaborator with that system of inequality. And if we start with the mentality that we're not here to make the system function better, we're here to change the system. 
We're here to upend this notion of inequality as normal. We're here to challenge the idea that the cream always rises to the top, right? Sometimes the cream is heavy and it sinks, right? And sometimes those who we expect the least from are the most capable. I worked in public housing as a community organizer for like 15 months and I saw some of the most capable, hardworking people I ever met there, right? Contrary to our stereotype, I remember, right, folks would tell me whenever I would tell them who I worked with, the poor folks that I worked with, the people who were quote unquote welfare recipients who we look down on in this culture, and they would always offer me unsolicited advice for them that I was just supposed to pass along, you know. Here's what these people need, oh great. You know, they never met these people, but they think they know what they need. And they would always say, what we need is we need to have some CEOs and you know, corporate executives go into the, into the quote unquote ghetto and teach these poor people how to manage money. <laughs> Are you kidding? Get rich people to tell poor people how to manage money? The hell, man, if you're rich enough, you can manage, right? It, in fact, you don't even have to manage your own dough when you're rich. That's the point. You hire out, right? You hire somebody else to manage your money. Rich people don't manage their own money, right? They got other stuff to do. They got other rich people stuff to do. Other people are managing their money for them. You know what takes skill? Not managing millions of dollars, let alone billions. You know what takes talent? What those women in public housing were doing, living on 327 a month, keeping their children alive, that takes skill. So maybe what we need is a mentality that says every day we come to work as educators, every day we come to work in a community college system intended to serve the community, we look at the people, or not just as sort of human resources that we're to sort of form like clay, right? But we look at them as promissory notes to a different future in this country. A different future where folks, regardless of ethnicity and culture and race and economic station and language of origin skills, right, can truly achieve what they're capable of achieving without the assumptions and the stereotypes of race and class and culture and linguistics. But the only way that's going to happen is for us to come in every day with that mentality that this is a war, right? Not in the violent sense, but in the ideological sense. And we are soldiers in that war whose job is to defeat the cynicism of a system set up by these supposedly great and learned men, right? But a system that was set up to crush the very kinds of people who come through these doors every day. This system wasn't set up for them. So when it doesn't serve them, that's not failure. That is success. If you want the system to begin to serve them, you gotta build a different machine. Thank you all so much for being here, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, I think we might do a little bit of a shift. We were scheduled to take a break. Are you comfortable staying and just instantly going into the poll? I see a lot of nodding because I think we're charged up and ready to go. Okay, so we are going to do a shift here. We're going to bring up Nani, who is way in the back. Nani Jackins Park is going to join us on stage. Um, I'm going to draw the, the blinds or the drapes here. This is a place where we actually want you to get out your cell phones. So go ahead and grab those cell phones. So are we going to sit here for this? Okay. <laughs> Can people see, or am I, I may be in the way. Let me move over a little bit further.
want you to text 37607. That's the number you're texting on one of your contacts. So your contact will be 37607. And the words that you're going to text. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Okay. You're going to text to the number 37607. The words that you will text in the message line are P J Highland because it is all about me. P J H Y L A N D. You should receive a message right back that's from poll everywhere. And mine said, "You've joined Patricia Highland session, P J Highland. When you're done, reply leave." Issues? I hear some pinging. I think you're getting in. Okay, so to start this, you can see the first question on the board, and just in case, I will read the question to you. The dynamics Tim talked about in his presentation, for example, ways that systematic oppression play out, happen in our district. A is strongly agree, B agree, C not sure, D disagree, and E strongly disagree. And by the way, this is anonymous. Yes? Okay, the dynamics Tim talked about in his presentation, for example, ways that systemic oppression play out happen in our district. A, strongly agree. B, agree. C, not sure. D, disagree. And E, strongly disagree. And by the way, the folks at De Anza are able to pr uh, participate in, well, there's some live streaming going on at De Anza. Okay. Oh, we're still getting some votes. Okay, we're going to move on to the second question. That was a moth. The second question, I believe my race plays a role in how I am treated in the district and has resulted in situations where I have experienced privilege or have felt targeted as described by Tim in his presentation? A, strongly agree. B, agree. C, not sure. D, disagree. E, strongly disagree. And I'm going to read the question again. I believe my race plays a role in how I am treated in the district and has resulted in situations where I have experienced privilege or have felt targeted as described by Tim in his presentation. Okay. Moving on to the third question. I believe our community, the district office and campuses, is ready to openly discuss issues related to privilege and oppression. A, strongly agree. B, agree. C, not sure. D, disagree. E, strongly disagree. Again, the question. I believe our community, parentheses, district office and campuses, is ready to openly discuss issues related to privilege and oppression. This is kind of cool, isn't it?
All right, let's go to the next one. I feel equipped to move forward and address issues of privilege and oppression. A, strongly agree. B, agree. C, not sure. D, disagree. E, strongly disagree. Again, the question. I feel equipped to move forward and address issues of privilege and oppression. Okay, next question. After listening to this presentation, I don't know how people are voting this quick. After listening to this presentation and conversation, I feel A, very comfortable, B, somewhat comfortable, C, neutral, D, somewhat uncomfortable, or E, very uncomfortable. Again, after listening to this presentation and conversation, I feel A, very comfortable, B, somewhat comfortable, I'm sorry, B, somewhat comfortable, C, neutral, D, somewhat uncomfortable, and E, very uncomfortable. So this is where um, we're going to stop on the poll for this moment. This was to inform both Nani and Tim so that they could engage in some dialogue with you, um, having gotten some feedback from the Foothill De Anza community. Hi. Hi. Nani Jackins Park, and I'm a consultant who's doing some work with your um, campus um, and district community to advance your equity initiatives. And um, this is a very interesting response. We would really like this to be an interactive conversation with a couple points. One is that this is one of many conversations um, that are related to this. And we recognize and, and, and really want to um, um, speak to the fact that we, we have about 45 minutes to have this conversation which isn't a sufficient time to really delve into um, the discussions in the ways that they are meant to be addressed. So we really hope that you will continue to have these conversations, um, deep, meaningful conversations um, after today in a, in a variety of, of ways. Um, so I would invite you, Tim, to speak to um, your response to the, the um, results of this flash polling. Well, first off, <laughs> Uh, I just, I, it's hilarious to actually give a presentation and then basically people are being polled on like, so, what do you think about that? And you're, <laughs> and you're like, and you're like sitting there and you're sort of like, I don't want to look at it. Uh, I really want to particularly thank the folks who didn't apparently agree with it or found it uncomfortable. I really, I appreciate that because that's not always easy to just be like, yeah, I think that was crap, you know? So, um, that's not necessarily what you're saying when you say you're uncomfortable, you could actually think it's legit and still be uncomfortable, but when you say like the stuff isn't happening at the institution, I appreciate that. Um, and I think it's important to know why you think that and, and to hear that perspective and to discuss that perspective. So um, I appreciate everyone, you know, sort of weighing in on it and, I, and particularly because I very deliberately did not want to try to predetermine what the specific action items at the institution and throughout the system need to be. It was a very deliberate choice. I mean, I've got some ideas, right? But I think that those are the things that are found in community. Solutions are found in community. And here you have this ready-made community of very capable people. Um, you're more than capable of figuring it out. I wanted to frame it sort of in terms of paradigms, right? In terms of overarching sort of views of, of what we're here to do and what are the things that keep us from doing it, particularly because we are smart people and I think we're mostly really compassionate people and we want to get it right. But none of us have quite figured out how to, how to solve this riddle yet. 
which either means that we're not as smart as we think, right? Or we might be as smart as we think, but maybe we're asking the wrong questions and we're trying to solve the wrong riddle, which is really the point that I was wanting to convey. And then after that, you'll have all this opportunity, not just this 45 minutes, right? But long after right. we're out of here, um, to think about what that means at every level of the institution. How do we operationalize these new paradigms, this way of thinking? How do we instill that in any of the new hires at the institution? How do we instill that in the students that come through the institution? How do we convey those mentalities to the families of the students who come through the institution? Right? That, that'll be the part you do. So I'm, I'm, I'm heartened by this, um, but at the same time, I know that, you know, anytime you have a survey, I mean, this is a, this is a, a pretty often used form of a survey, a model of a survey, but you know, when you ask questions that are strongly agree, agree, not sure, strongly disagree, or disagree, it's still imprecise. You're right on the board. So, you know, let's not take this as gospel. I don't look at that and go, oh, oh people are really comfortable. I, mean, I don't necessarily buy that. Or, or, yeah, I think we're real clear on how this plays out in the district. Well, you know, maybe you feel pretty clear right now because you just heard a presentation, right? But maybe in a week, you won't. Something will happen and you'll go in a different direction. So um, I think it's a very fluid thing, but it's a good starting spot. You know? right. Another dynamic is that um, the goal isn't really for comfort. Discomfort can be a really strong tool, and um, negotiating our relationships with discomfort and what our discomfort can teach us and, and tell us is important as well. Um, given your point about um, this being, you know, kind of a, a broad brushstroke um, tool and, and there being many um, different complexities that are related to that, there are two microphones. Um, on either side of the room, and we would love to hear a few responses um, to maybe f paint some finer detail on your responses to the poll. Are there a few folks who might, and could you go to the um, mics, just because I know that it's um, being videotaped? They're just right um, behind you. On either side. And anyone and who, who wants a mic but isn't physically able to get to them, we'll bring it to you. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Tim. It's too low. So my observation is that there seems to be a community of people, at least on the Foothill campus, that are very committed to equity and to issues of racial inequality and who show up repeatedly at these sorts of events. I see a lot of familiar faces here. And there's another segment of campus that is completely divorced from the conversation. So answering a question like, to what degree do you feel like people are participating in the movement forward, as Tim was just saying, is a little bit complicated because some people are moving forward really quickly and other people are completely not engaged. So I, I feel like the real challenge ahead of us is how to bring those people in and convince them that this is a thing that they should want to be engaged with. I think part of the problem sometimes in institutions is that um, we have a, a cadre of people who are engaged because perhaps the discipline that they teach is one that regularly engages these questions in some way, and so they become the usual suspects in an academic setting. We know they're going to show up because they teach this kind of subject, or they teach that, they teach a certain social science, they teach literature, they teach history, they teach whatever. Um, and I think there are a lot of other people who actually might be really interested in the subject, but they don't know how it relates to their discipline, um, or they don't know how they would work any of that into their practice, right? And, and then there are other people who don't know how it fits in their discipline and are convinced it doesn't. So we got really three groups, right? One that's already sort of in it because their discipline leads them in that direction. Others who might want to be in it but don't know where to start. And others who are just like, what does this have to do with hard sciences and math? You know, now here's the reality um, that there's a lot of research on that, which actually finds that there are specific techniques and ways pedagogically to bring that kind of material that doesn't seem to be about race or ethnicity or culture at all particularly in areas like math and science, to students that will be more effective than other ways when they are working class, when they are persons of color, when they are English language learners. 
if you don't know what that research says, then you're not gonna be able to plug into it, right? But if there are certain approaches that work better with this group over here than with this group, it's your job professionally to figure out what that is and to, and to look that up and to do a little bit of homework because, you know, it's like I made a joke several years ago, even, even people in the, in the traditional disciplines that talk about race, um, I know a lot of lit professors, literature professors who talk about race in an English class, but, um, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you haven't updated your skill set and your pedagogical tools to take advantage of a different constituency set than would have been, let's say, 30 years ago, then you, you're, not, you're not really a good educator any longer because the students who were here 30 years ago different than the ones who were here now. The ones who were here 50 years ago different than, if, you know, it's like if you're a Shakespeare scholar, for instance, um, and, and you don't know feminist critiques of Shakespearean literature, multicultural critiques of Shakespearean literature, which have been very prominent in the last 30 years, then you are not a Shakespeare scholar anymore. You are a Shakespeare scholar in 1713. You're a hell of a Shakespeare scholar in 1926. But we're not in those years, we're here. And so everybody, I think, needs to recognize there are some ways to make sure that no matter what you're teaching, it's about figuring out if, if not everyone is getting it, if not everyone is succeeding at the same rate, you either have to make one of two assumptions. Either this group over here is just straight up inferior, which is an inherently racist belief, right? Or something's going wrong between your mouth and their ears as an educator or as an administrator. Something's happening that isn't clicking. And so I think that's how we bring more people in is to let them know this is their issue too. And it's about, it's about how do we get everyone to succeed to the level of their true abilities, which are far more equal than we like to sometimes believe and certainly more equal than the stereotypes tell us. And if, and if we're not doing that, then let's figure out how to do it. And there might be a lot of different approaches, but it's our job to, to discover them and not always leave it up to the same five departments or same 10 or 15 folks who always talk about this stuff. Hi, um, I teach English and I've been doing uh, a lot of work around equity and I really appreciate the point that you said it's about community, the solutions around community. And I think that if we're really gonna be serious as a community college, we have to put our mission statement into effect. All of the solutions are there. We've already known them, we've identified them. So it's about the practices and what we fear um, that is really preventing us from actually seeing each other as community. So for me, it's just like are we really going to get serious about being community because we have the knowledge, the diversity, the capacity, the, the population. For me, this is the place where I think it should happen and it should happen organically because we have people coming from so many different socioeconomic, I mean, the, the diversity that is present in, present in any community college is the solution. So how are we not engaging as community first and foremost before assessment, timelines? I mean, right now, this mostly the seats are empty. Why? Where are our students? What's, what's going on? And for me, I think it's also important for us to see the cliff we're headed towards. I'm not sure that I'm gonna have um, social security or uh, a pension in 20 years. Just because I'm faculty and I have health insurance doesn't mean that our government is gonna head and secure those, those jobs and that privilege that I've acquired. So we need to be very urgent because our students are in a much more precarious situation. So it's time for us to really just figure out how we are going to be community, how we're gonna actually put our mission statement into effect. I don't have the solutions but I have some strategies, and we all have, the way I see it, and this is what I tell to my students, you have the pieces of the puzzle. Bring it, share it, be a collective, be a learning community, and we'll all improve and succeed. And as a community college of educators, we should practice what we already stated in our mission statement, I believe. Very well said. We have time for um, one more comment, and then we are going to um, break into some small groups for discussions to speak to exactly on the point that you've just made so well. So one more comment? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I just actually, it's, it's uh, piggybacking on the two last comments that were made. Just in looking at the poll numbers and, and speaking specifically to that, I really feel like the big population is not represented there, and that is our students and that if we're talking about these issues, um, we really need to figure out a way to have um, our students, current and future, 
and former here. Um, so I don't know what to do with those numbers and what that's telling me without their voice as a part of it. Well, I think, I think you definitely need to ask these same questions that we've just asked of you, of the student population. You know, how, how much do they think you're serious about engaging these conversations, right? Uh, obviously, not having been in the room, they, they can't answer a question about the presentation content, but, but in general, and that goes back to the first point I made about trusting people's judgment about their own life, right? And are we prepared to hear what those answers might sound like, which is, no, I don't think that we're serious. And, and, and going back to the comment about the mission, I mean, this is, this is so critical that, that every single thing, I mean, you know, if I were to ask most students and maybe even most of you in this room, do you know what the mission of the institution is? Like, not word for word, but, but pretty clearly without having to look it up, the odds are maybe not because I don't think we tend to focus a lot on that and it may seem esoteric, but it's really important. You have a mission statement, it says why you exist. Right? And every decision you make ought to be filtered through that lens. Every single thing that happens ought to be about does it uphold the mission or not. And it's important to convey what that mission is to people in the institution so they know. Because building community, it's not just about, it's not some charitable thing that we do for the folks that are being marginalized. Every single one of you that works in this institution has an interest in advocating for whoever's here, right? And, and, and advocating with whoever is here. And if the public, keep in mind, for the last 30 to 40 years, Anything that is associated with a public good, whether that is publicly financed education, whether that is publicly financed transportation, whether that is publicly financed health care, whether that is publicly financed parks, right? Anything that's public has been falling into disrepute, has it not? Where it's almost like, no, no, we just want to privatize things. And, 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 and you know, if you really study this research on this, the reason that's happened is because public goods have been increasingly associated with different kinds of people than used to be the case. When the public goods were New Deal programs being provided to white families, everybody loved big government. And the minute that it was government stuff that maybe was being perceived as being given to those people who look different, pray different, have different customs, different language, different culture, then all of a sudden we started rethinking our commitment to the public. Well, that ain't about politics now. If you work in this institution, your, your literal career, your future is, is about making sure the public values public and community-based institutions. So those students become literally the lifeline for your careers. This is, this is about self-help, basically. We're just trying to help y'all. You know, the, those who are in the dominant group need to understand, like, like, whoever comes through those doors, you better hope the public values them, not just that you do, but that the public does, because that's going to affect your budgets. So this is, again, this is, a, this is an ideological war that has to be fought to build that, that sense of community. Go ahead, one more, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm just kind of disappointed that we do have so many empty chairs here today and I'm very honored that you're here and, and joining us. I've read your work, so wow. Uh, I just really, I just wonder how can we do this work in a way where we have more faculty because we do struggle with, I think, folks who tell their classes, you know, not all of you are going to be here by the middle of the, of the quarter and by the end it'll be even fewer. So h how do we, if we are so comfortable dealing with this, which is amazing that we're that comfortable, sometimes it doesn't feel like we're this comfortable dealing with this topic. If we are, how do we turn this around? What do we do after today to make sure um, our students that are afraid of ICE raids and impacted by that and, and don't necessarily walk in the same comfort we do actually get closer to it? You want to take a stab at that? Um, one of the issues that, Jim, uh, that Tim um, um, addressed in a way that I really resonated with in his presentation is that if you build the system to produce sausages, then the expectation um, and surprise that you have um, that when you're getting Chicken McNuggets or the, when you're not getting Chicken McNuggets um, really speaks to that. When I work with organizations, one of the things that I ask is, um, how is it that your system creates an outcome where faculty um, can survive and be successful with those expectations? What are the expectations? How is the system built to expect pedagogical competencies? 
And I've worked with college, um, colleges and we start talking about what is it that you want your faculty and staff members to know? What is it that you want your student leaders to know? What knowledge sets, what skills, and, and, and relationships to community will help them to be successful? And then you look at some of the um, required competencies and skills, and they don't um, reflect anything about what it takes to be successful in a contemporary learning environment. And so really, some of those questions go back to what are the systems that not only are you creating, and this is not just you as in Foothill De Anza, what are the systems that you are um, creating and allowing to exist, and do they, as Tim said, do they all roll up to what you say your mission is, and what your heart and spirit and minds desire most for your students? And then, if they don't, if the ways that you're working and operating don't roll up to your hearts and minds and spirits desires for your students, then there's a change necessary. And then it, it is necessary that those old ways become intolerable for you. Right, I mean, what would, what would happen if, just to think of one thing, if, if people were evaluated, if, if faculty, staff, administrators, people who have direct contact with students and are responsible at least in part for nurturing them and getting them through an institution. What, what if your, your promotion, your, your career, was evaluated in part on the extent to which you help reduce gaps in failure to complete, right? I mean, what if, and why shouldn't it be? Why shouldn't that be one of the things you're grading on? Because if, if a teacher is effective at getting some people through but not others, and there's a discernible difference that has to do with class or race or ethnicity or culture, why, why is that not a ding on their, on their evaluation? Why is that allowed? Why is it okay to have big gaps between white students and students of color or middle class students and working class students or you know, English language learners and others? It seems to me, if, if I'm an effective educator, I ought to be able, I'm not gonna reach every single student. Not every single student is gonna succeed, but there shouldn't be discernible group-based differences that are significant unless I start with the assumption that there are discernible group-based differences inherent to those groups, which makes me a racist by definition and should disqualify me from setting foot in a classroom teaching anybody. So, so at some point, that's got to be part of the evaluation. And then if we do that, students will see it. Students will know, oh, well, those are some competencies that we're now actually testing for, in a right. sense, right? We, we, we're a country that likes to uh, measure what we value and we value only that which we measure. So if we're not measuring our effectiveness at reducing gaps, then what we're saying is we don't really value it. And if we are measuring it, then we're saying that we do and we're trying to get better at it. Right? Yes. I just want to thank you uh, and everyone here for having this conversation. You certainly uh, started us thinking about uh, a lot of different things. I now see this as a micro and macro type uh, uh, challenge. And then at the micro level, at the classroom, at the institution, we are working really hard to work, uh, come into uh, equality and diversity and things like that. But my question to you is at the macro level, you mentioned the government and you know, we get mandates from the federal government, from the state government, and sometimes they tell us that we have to do certain things, and I don't know if we could do those things, and I don't know if those are good mandates for us. And so I'm really concerned about that. And another concern I have is, you know the textbook company that we now are using uh, from K through 12, maybe even from preschool to higher education. I, I think we are not looking at that source. And I just want your opinion or strategies to, you know, bring it out there and then maybe challenge those guys a little bit more. What is our work? How can we uh, go beyond the micro level? Thank you. You want to go first on that? Um, again, in response to that, and, and, I want, and I'd like to address um, something that you just said as well, 
in terms of um, some of the dynamics that you just talked about in, in preparation in textbook, in looking at how systems of dominance um, shape thoughts and, and how we um, are critical about our involvement and addressing and using our voice and agency and all of those things to examine how the systems um, result in the results they do. And sometimes we're not as um, critical in our reflections about how all of these things come together. So in talking about textbooks, for example, um, in t terms of voice, what are the textbooks telling our students about who they are? Um, in some doctoral research, um, I, I had the chance to talk with scholars of color, and one of the Native American um, men who participated in my study said, you know, every year I would start in elementary school by opening up the indices of my textbooks and seeing what did they say about people like me? Did they celebrate people like me? Was there any recognition that people who looked and acted and thought and belonged like me had done anything worthy of being celebrated in the history books. And he said that finally in his high school years there were some mentions, but the mentions weren't accurate. They were certainly not, they didn't promote any sense of cultural integrity. So then I think about in, in, at the micro and the macro level, how are we using our voice to interrupt, disrupt, challenge, and, and then build the bridge from challenge to support, because the same student services, the same developmental challenges what we have for students to challenge and support, um, link to the comment that you made about what do we do um, to support educators, and, and my team uses the term educator very broadly. It, it's, it's faculty members and it's student services folks and it's students, it's, it's folks on, in communities whose jobs are to support the learning of others both in terms of the classic idea of the student and then the rest of us as learners, what, what, how, how do we then bridge that challenge and support for folks whose, whose pedagogical notions are outdated and then are kind of like butting up against that reality and they see the rest of um, the world changing in their midst we are no longer, you know, the agrarian or industrial um, society where it isn't in people's best interest to make sure that everyone has access to education. We're now in a knowledge economy and our communities depend on educational institutions and their abilities to make access to education real and viable. So what it takes now and the knowledge of the diverse needs that students from an incredibly wide range of communities um, bring to our door, you have to demand that of all the educators on your campus. So what happens to the people who then have this dawning awareness that, wow, I don't know what you need me to know and I don't know how to, to do what you're asking me to do. So, I don't want to have a part in these conversations. I would guess that if it wasn't a self-selected population, we would have larger numbers, and this idea makes me really, really uncomfortable. Now again, I, I'm not an enemy of discomfort. When people say, Nani, as a consultant, you, you know, I feel really uncomfortable with what you're saying, I say pretty regularly, my job is not to make you comfortable. The idea that it is my job to facilitate comfortable conversations is kind of a supremacist notion, right? Whose comfort is more important? The students we need to be uncomfortable for, the learners we need to be uncomfortable for, or our own because we're afraid of what comes next. So one of the challenges then is how do you set a vision for here's what we need you to know, here's what we need you to be able to do, and then how do you provide the support and the scaffolding to say, and, and we're gonna create a system that values you as a contributor, and we're gonna build your capacity to do that. And so, you know, in, in coming and talking to a lot of you, it is this underlying current um, and, and concern that has been voiced of, well, am I gonna, if, if our campuses and district office really engage equity, am I gonna be excluded from this conversation in a way that I can't survive? And the goal is no, and there are expectations. 
And the challenge will be to hold the dualities that are pr present in that very real conversation. It's no. Really, our community should do our best to help you scaffold and support you to build your capacity to do that. But if you decide that you really don't care, then it's probably time for you to decide if this is the best place for you. So there are a lot of complexities in that conversation. And, and I would just add going to the piece about textbooks and learning and, you know, you're, you're dealing with students and even yourselves who if you haven't been exposed to that different paradigm of, of the world, if you haven't, if the students come in and they haven't been exposed to the narrative that includes them, um, and, and this isn't just racial and ethnic, uh, working class folks, including working class white folks, who make up a disproportionate share of the white students who come through community colleges, are also not really part of a narrative about this country that we learn. Our narrative is usually about heroic founding fathers, soldiers, and billionaires or millionaires who built the economy. We don't really learn about working, average everyday working folks generally, right? So the narrative has been both class exclusive and race and culture exclusive. So if you've got students who are coming in having been really marginalized from the story, whether on the basis of one or several of those identities, and you as an educator, you, you know, you can't teach what you don't know. So if you weren't taught those things either, then there's an opportunity for us to actually see ourselves as being in that boat with those students. We've all been misled, right? We're sort of halfway down the conveyor belt in the sausage factory. And up to now, we've all been shaped by the machine to know some things and to not know some things. And so it's not your students' fault if they don't see themselves in the story. And it's not your fault if you don't know how they fit in the story. But the job of, of an institution is not only to help them find that, it's to help you find that. It's professional development to say, we want you to learn that along with them. Now, all of a sudden, there's a solidarity there. It's about saying, let's, let's learn together what has been left out. That's what creating a community is about. Let's learn together how we've all been misshapen and underserved, which is a term I hate because it implies passivity. But, but how have we been ill-served, better, better way of saying it, badly served um, by an educational system that hasn't really included everyone? And, and the fact that you're having to pick up after 12 years or 13 years of that process um, where folks have been, you know, steered away from their own sense of competency, their own sense of, of, of efficacy is really unfortunate. The question is, what do you do with that? And that's why I think if you take the mentality that we're going to fight this, this sort of um, this machine together, right, it conveys a very different mentality to the student that makes them feel like you're not just a you know, sort of sage on the stage, talking head, giving them information as a teacher, as a student services person, as an administrator, but you're someone who's, you know, invested in learning with them uh, how to make the community a truly functional one. Um, in the interest of time and the, the last thing that we wanted to come out of this conversation, and that is what is your investment? If we're going to talk about community, and it's so um, great that things happen as they're supposed to, I think. Um, so the theme that has been brought up of community um, kind of um, organically in your conversation, if you're invested as a community, what is your investment? That's the last thing that we would like to talk with you about. Again, this is a conversation that cannot happen in totality in the very few moments that we have. So we're really talking about many, many conversations, much more engagement, much more strategic engagement in the future. And each of you, as part of this community, have to make an investment. So we're going to invite you for about 10 minutes to, to um, gather in small groups. Some of you are um, seated a, a little more distant um, from others. So if you could cluster and and really talk about what is your own individual investment in this. And then we're going to ask a few people to talk about what are you going to do. And again, this isn't an absence of um, greater systemic strategic planning and community building and facilitated efforts to move forward. But if you think of yourself as a member of a very um, committed and, and um, powerful community, and I don't 
tend to use the word empowered because it, it has this kind of feeling that someone gives you the power. But if today you decide that you have the power to enact change in your community, what's your contribution? So we'll invite you to have that conversation for a few minutes, and then we will invite you a, a few of you to talk about compelling things that come in your conversation. Could you take your seats? There are, there's a couple of things that we're going to do. Um, before we have you respond to this last slide, uh, a couple of folks said, you know, I still was, was really wishing to have the opportunity to ask a question. So we're going to uh, have these two mics one more time. If you would like to ask a question, at least two folks came up uh, during the break and asked me if they could ask a question. So if you would head to one of those two mics, um, both Tim and Nani said they would be more than happy to answer a few more. So here we go. So um, I have a question more around the idea of organizational change with regards to racial equity and like maybe the best approach about how to do that because a lot of it we've been talking about, you know, messages that we're getting from on high and how that impacts our ability to do the little things that can sort of move this equity conversation. And I feel like just in the time that I've been uh, an employee of the college and within the district that I've consistently noticed this tension between the idea that true change and a true belief in equity comes through sort of that relational, uh, that relationship building, people's desire to want to see that happen. And then on the other hand, knowing both uh, historically and, you know, uh, just seeing the trends that sometimes appealing to people's morality or sense of morality is not what moves equity, right? Uh, policies and laws that were put in place to ensure equity did not come about because we appealed to the morality of the people. It was having enough people in positions of power to make that change. And so the, the question is, I, I feel like I'm always noticing this tension between um, sort of wanting people to move on their own and then a, another set of people saying, you know, well, we just need to implement the policies and force people along, you know, sort of kicking and screaming because that's just what needs to happen because, you know, it's a moral issue and that if we just wait for people to kind of jump on board then you know we're going to be waiting for the longest time or continuously centering the conversation of equity around the comfort level or the discomfort level of people who this conversation I don't want to say isn't really about but you know centering that conversation um, in a different direction so I was just wondering your thoughts on that because um, well, I don't think that there's a, a necessary contradiction between a, an approach that says that there's a moral imperative for equity and one that says there's a practical imperative. I think we think of those things as distinct, but the truth is if, some, if, if equity is a moral imperative, then anything that doesn't get us there or makes it worse practically is ethically a challenged thing. And, and, and if, and if and if this is the proper way to go, or, or if this is something that actually can benefit the institution, then it has ethical legs. And so I think the two can work together. And, and let me give you an example of what I mean. I think, you know, the point that we, when we were talking about the mission and we were talking, and I made the point about, you know, the importance of creating community because the continuity of this very institution requires it, that's not really a moral argument. I mean, I think there's a moral argument to be made that we have a moral obligation to provide opportunity to those who have been excluded from opportunity, both historically and contemporaneously, but that's really a functional argument. That's an argument about the long-term viability of the community college system, whether that's in California or anywhere else in the country. It's about the long-term viability, not just of the community college system. I would say the same thing when I went to, I went to, gave a speech at Phillips Exeter, which is, you know, one of the most, you know, hoity-toity, prep schools in the United States. 
And for the last 40 years, they have been, to their credit, now they still got a ton of issues, as you can imagine, but Phillips Exeter, which at one point was just rich, white, East Coast males, and then it became co-ed, and now it's almost 40% students of color. And that's not just because they're plucking international folks, you know, and bringing them over for a lot of money. It's also, we're talking folks of color in the United States, a lot of black folks and brown folks who were now students there. Now, are they experiencing no issue? Well, of course not. There's still racism and stuff going on. But, the, but here's what they've done. They made her, they, they recognize, this is Phillips Exeter now, that, that has been able to coast on an elite white model for a long, long time, basically said, listen, if we, if we keep this up, we're not gonna exist in 100 years, right? That what it means to be an Exonian, which is the weird name that they give one another, um, what it means to be an Exonian has got to shift because they're just not gonna be enough rich white dudes to keep us in business in 100 years from now. And, and, and so here's the deal, like, yeah, there's a moral and ethical imperative for equity and for justice because it's been so long denied and we ought to do right by folks for that reason. But if we don't, uh, a lot of y'all gonna be out of jobs. You know, that's just the truth. Uh, I'm not gonna be the only one that, that, that uh, you know, well, I guess I'll still have a job, right? Regardless, if there's inequity, I guess I'll get to keep running my mouth. But if there's inequity for too much longer, y'all won't even be in the positions that you have because you're already in a state that has increasingly you know, comprised of folks of color and that's who you're gonna be serving and working class people who come through the CC system. So it seems to me that if we make the case as a combination case, there's a moral and ethical imperative, there's also a practical necessity that we learn new skills, that we deepen our knowledge. And if we don't do it, we're not good at our jobs anymore. You know, you just can't keep the same approach when you've got a different set of factors, a different set of, 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 of constituents and a different country and a different community. Um, and so I think that there's a real practical piece, not just the moral, but you might want to add to that. Well, one of my concerns, um, um, Adrian, in, in that's kind of embedded in some of the conversations that people have of, you know, well, I'm a good person, I'm not a racist, for example. I mean, even before we get into the intricacies of the systemic um, understanding of what it means to be a racist from a very, very kind of technical perspective, when people will say, but I'm a good person, um, it, 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 it weaves apart the fact that we live within systems of oppression. So when we talk about sexism, for example, I will have people come to me and say, well, I'm gonna teach my son not to be sexist. And that's great. It's wonderful, we all hope that as people who care about the next generation that we're gonna do our best to give, you know, to, to give a voice to the lies that, that um, misogyny kind of socializes us to believe. And so then we start thinking of it as a moral thing. I'm going to teach my sons not to believe the lies that misogyny teaches us. I'm gonna believe, I'm gonna teach my daughters, I'm gonna um, teach my genderqueer kids to not even think about gender identity in those same ways, and that's gonna be enough, because if I'm good enough, I'm moral enough, I'm whatever enough, then that's gonna take care of the system. The reality is that we are all embedded. I mean, the critical theorists would say we are so embedded in these strong systems that systemically keep us in these patterns of beliefs and that assign rank and power and agency and target status that we have to do both and at the same time. And I remember um, back when I was um, a college student and um, spending a couple of days in, in workshop with Daryl Sue, who was a younger professional at the time. And he would say that we of course want people to be motivated by the social justice imperatives. And if not, the demographic realities are gonna make it impossible for them not to face these dynamics. And so again, I would resonate with what Tim is saying. Of course we want this to be the moral imperative and the duality is that the systems have to um, support the outcomes as well at the same time. On, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, this isn't specifically about education, it's, uh, um, but, it, but I thought I'd toss it out and let you comment. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the, the guy in Starbucks who thought, oh, I'm not getting waited on fast enough, or, and, and the other example. And uh, 
So I, I run across people online, and I, I have I have friends and relatives who uh, uh, voted for the current president and, and, and have the attitude of uh, we're not being listened to, we're being oppressed, and that that leaves me like well, um, no, and, and I, but 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 I don't know how to deal with them. So yeah, how do how do what's a good way to deal with them? So I could ah wow. Yeah. Um. Well, oh, there's so many sarcastic answers. <laughs> but I, they're not paying me for the snark, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to give you a real one. Um, you know, I think the struggle, and it is a struggle for me personally, um, is to try to remember that folks with whom I have even the most profound differences um, have come to where they are for reasons that are, perhaps I can't completely understand, but I'm sure I've come to where I am for reasons they can't. We all have a lens that we've adopted about these issues we're talking about today and about politics, and none of our lenses are truly objective, you know? So it's really easy for those of us who did not vote, for instance, for the current president to go, oh my God, cannot believe this. But it's equally easy for them to go, oh my God, I can't believe you don't see what I see. Well, the question is, did we really, I mean, those of us who didn't vote for this president, did we really, I mean, are we so objective, such perfect arbiters of truth that we've really read everything there is to read, we know everything there is to know? Of course not, and neither do they. Part of, of building community around these issues that we've been discussing or any other is being willing to acknowledge that we're all shaped by a number of social forces. And so part of it is having the humility to do that. And it can be tough. I mean, when I, when I started doing this work, I had just graduated from college in 1990, and those of you who've read White Like Me know the story. I was in the work against David Duke, who was running for the United States Senate and then governor at that time. So here we have this overt white supremacist, lifelong, really since the teenage years, neo-Nazi, former Klan leader, who comes very close to winning. And he comes very close to winning because he gets 60%, 6-0% of the white vote. And black folks luckily saved us from ourselves, and so we didn't end up with a Nazi for senator or for governor. But when all that was over with, myself and, and all of us who were involved in that campaign had to sit around and say, you know, what really separates us from those 620,000 white people that thought it was a good idea to vote for a Nazi? Because I knew that we didn't have 620,000 Nazis in Louisiana. I knew that, right? Uh, I'm Jewish. I got a really well-tuned Nazi detector. Like, I, I got reasons. I know. I pay attention, right? So 620,000 Nazis? No, my God, of course not. Or some of them, maybe. But most of them were just scared little people, just like all of us are sometimes. We're scared little people, imperfect, flawed people who get moved around the chessboard by forces that we don't even often discern. And the only thing that really separated me from them, I had to, I had to try on a little humility, right? Because it would have been so easy to go, oh my God, how do, you, how do you vote for a Nazi? What the hell's wrong with you? But the only reason that I knew better, well, A, I'm Jewish, so there is that. Um, you generally know not to vote for the Nazi when you're a Jew. It's like, comes with the territory. Um, but, but, but the only reason I'm Jewish is because I was raised Jewish, right? Which is just happenstance that I was born into a family where my dad was Jewish and that's how I was raised. The only other stuff that separated me from them was that I'd had a set of experiences that were different, right? I'd gone to preschool at a historically black college. I went to schools that were 40, 45% African American. I was in sort of multiracial teams and institutions my whole life. I had parents that were very intentional about certain things. Well, it's not like I earned those parents. It's not like I did anything to deserve that life. I just, I was lucky to have it, so then I had a very different perspective. They had a very different experience, which gave them a different perspective. The minute that I stopped being smug about mine, I could, I could at least hear them, treat them like humans, listen to what their fears are, and then have a real conversation about whether they're properly diagnosing their fear. See, we all, we all misdiagnose stuff from time to time. Do I think that Trump supporters have horribly misdiagnosed the pain that millions of them are actually in? Yes, but you know what? I once misdiagnosed a pain on my side as cancer because I decided to Google it, right? And, and that was no more intelligent, really, in my estimation, than what somebody who votes for, for someone I can't relate to did. We all get stuff wrong, you know? I'll spend hours, I get a pain, I'm like, oh, what's that? You know, don't consult Dr. Google. It's a terrible idea. But I did it, and I was like, I know, I've got a horrible problem. No, I pulled a muscle, you know? 
big deal. And I would say maybe they've misdiagnosed their pain. They would say, I've misdiagnosed other stuff. Cool, that's fine. But we can have that conversation if we understand that we all sort of come to where we end up because of a number of forces that are not objective. There's actually some research that says some of it's biological, right? Which is frightening to think that maybe to some extent our politics might be embedded in us. And that doesn't mean they can't change. But it means that we got to start with the realization that none of us are objective, none of us see things exactly clearly, none of us have read all the work there is to read, looked at all the data there is to, 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 to look at. Um, and so I think one of the ways we can start to deal with folks who politically maybe are on the other side of us or ideologically is to have a conversation. Tell me why you think what you think. Don't tell me what you think. Tell me why you think it. That's a really different conversation, isn't it? Because anybody can tell you what they think. Right? We're really good at that as a culture. Well, I think this. Well, I think this. Tell me why you think it. I'll tell you why I think what I think about race. And that's what my entire book is about, is telling you this is my life. This is how I came to see this. Doesn't mean that it's objective truth for everyone. I'm just telling you my story. And you're free to accept it, reject it, take some and leave the rest. I want to know about you. Tell me why you believe that the guy, the guy in Starbucks, tell me why you think that's oppression. I really want to know. Right? Tell me why you think that getting slow service is because you're a white guy and she's black and you were a Trump supporter, which she wouldn't have even known until you said it. Right? Explain it to me, because what I've learned is a lot of times when you ask people to explain why they think stuff, they can't. And that's when they start to perhaps rethink the stuff that they think, because they can't really articulate the why behind what they think. I've found myself doing that sometimes on other subjects than this, you know, where I haven't spent a lot of time studying somebody, why do you think that? And I'll try to answer it and I'm like, that was pretty stupid. That answer wasn't real strong, you know? So, my thoughts. But. One of the things I think is hard for folks is um, that we live in a culture that really dichotomizes things. Things are good or bad, right or wrong. And the reality is that we live lives where there can be competing rights that happen at the same time. And um, I, for, for years, I was co-chair of Washington State's Faculty and Staff of Color Conference. And um, in Washington State, the Faculty and Staff of Color Conference was an opportunity for a lot of professionals um, who spent a lot of time not breathing on their campuses, gave them a chance to exhale in a sense of community that was profound, and people waited for it. Just that sense, and you can imagine, of being with people where you can just not have to explain and interpret and be in service of. And that expectation um, that too often um, people of color are expected to be the ones who facilitate others' learning or to do the work. So here's an opportunity that people just looked forward to for a long time. And in the planning, there were lots of things that went wrong. And um, we were just in this very tired place, and there was this small group of very, very, very powerful women. Maybe not positionally powerful, but spiritually and, and intellectually, and just in terms of their presence, powerful women. And one of the facilities guys from the campus that hosted that year's conference came, and he says very earnestly, I've been waiting for you this group of colored people to come. What are you doing here? You can imagine their response was, Ugh. and they looked at me and they said, oh, you're the chair, deal with this. And they left because they were so tired. Well, it was very, very clear to this man that he had said something that he really should not have said. But he didn't understand it, because he, he had read it not as the faculty and staff of color conference. It was OK, so that means that this is a group of colored people. He didn't understand the very tortured history and tradition that was assigned to those words and that language and all of the different um, pieces of trauma that were embedded in using those particular words at those particular times. And so if you think about it, who was right and who was wrong? And unfortunately, it becomes this clash, right? So then, um, you know, so I was the person who was charged with having that conversation. And he said, I clearly have said something terrible. Help me understand that. 
There's a very, very legitimate reason why sometimes you just don't want to have to be that person in every time to be subject to other people's learning. Because as, as a person from a marginalized group, is it always my responsibility to be there to facilitate others' learning? So I can see that there was a right in terms of these women who were on overtime at this point. But that didn't make that man wrong. And it turns out that his motivations were really legitimate. He truly had come because as a facilities person, he wanted to support the success of the conference. So he came with a good and willing heart. And he didn't have the understanding or the use of language that it took to be graceful in his process. So then, what is it in our response that is graceful? Like, what tools and skills and commitments and agreements and social contracting does it take for us to be graceful in those moments? I mean, and then the complexity is, then when are, those, when are the times we say, you know what, this is not my conversation to facilitate? So again, as you, know, you Tim, said, there, there, aren't, there isn't this great list of do this every time. It is recognizing the, um, the complexities of how we as human beings interact. And so I often will think, what is the function of this communication? If the function of this communication is to use me as a target for your frustration that we're now at this place in our communities that you don't like and you're frustrated that people like me are having more voice and agency, so you think that I'm not powerful enough in my presence to combat you, I'm not going to give you the same response because I don't owe you that response in the same way as if I'm in a professional capacity or if I'm in a space where I can recognize that you as a human being are in a very vulnerable moment because you don't know how to convey the truth that your heart is asking you to convey. So what's the function of the communication at that point? And then what skills and tolerance are you bringing to the situation at the time too? So that's my response. Are those the questions, Pat? Are there? Do we want to come up to the to where we are here and talk a little bit about this? Great, yeah. We would love to hear people's responses from your conversations. We saw some really um, great engagement. Would some folks be willing to come and share some of the highlights from your conversations? And we're glad that people have, you know, we have some of that up on here because yes. you've, you've typed it in, but we'd love to hear it in your voice, what some of these things mean to you and the group of people that you were speaking with, if you want to flesh them out a little bit more, rather than just having us all turn and read the page, if you want to share them publicly, that would be great. Yes, yes please, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, my name is April Henderson and I work with EOPS at, here at Foothill. And our group, we had a really nice conversation or active uh, conversation and um, some of the commitments that we made were uh, started uh, from just being aware, self-aware of uh, the current state of where our students are and kind of off of our group. It's, I think my personal belief is not just being self-aware of where our students are and the state of affairs in the country, in the world, mm -hmm. but also being aware where we are as a staff and community because a lot of these uh, initiatives, especially as we're talking about equity now, my experience within this um, enlightenment, <laughs> for lack of a better word, um, is that when we, when we um, as we receive money from the state to pour into these issues, um, we, are, we are given a limited amount of time to do the work. And it's, it's, it, it's very hard to do the work in a certain amount of time. And then when it doesn't work, you have, you know, oh, it wasn't gonna work in the first place. And I've been here long enough to know it's, we've done this before, and then there's no sustainability. And um, we're, we're very vulnerable when we, throw things at program, money at programs, if we don't believe in them as an institution. Um, and I, and I, I don't mean that just with Foothill, I mean that statewide. Um, 
So anyway, my commitment in my program was to be aware of you know, all the things that are happening that affect our students. Um, we also had a commitment to creating mechanism to bring student voice in the room. I think someone also mentioned earlier, and, we, and I've been, and, and the person who brought this up, we've been in a number of meetings and we don't have a student voice and we need to figure out how we can get them in on these conversations so we can get perspective. Um, part of being aware is to be aware of the state of our students and right now one of the uh, most concerning issues is homelessness, food insecurities. We're talking about this throughout the state of California. We need to know, and, and I'm sure there are staff members in our community that have no idea. I just happen to work with a group of students that I talk to every day, and these are some of their uh, number one concerns, let alone trying to pass a class with an instructor, as you mentioned, who doesn't have any concern of what they're going through. Um, I'm, forgive me, I'm so passionate, I'm kind of all over the place. It's okay, um, thank you. Another of our group members talked about having those uncomfortable conversations and not being afraid to have them. Um, I'm always, just in my experience, I'm always thinking, okay, how do you have this conversation with someone without a, you know, you don't want to, I mean, we're, we are, in all truth, this is our job, this is our livelihood, and how do you have that conversation with an administrator, for instance, someone who holds your position, you know, can make your position very uncomfortable. But this person in our group said, hey, we can't be afraid to have those conversations. We need to figure out how we can, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we're, we, we need to be okay with that. And, and as an institution, as Ilda mentioned, if we stick to our mission, and if we have these conversations through the lens of our mission, that's our, you know, that's our document. You know, that's, that's your argument. Um, also, and finally, um, just talking to people you don't usually talk to on campus. You know, um, stepping out of your own, own little cubicle, if you will. Um, I know, I, through my experience, I know there's people on campus that don't come out of the cubicle other than to take their break, than to take their lunch, you know, and they come and go. And these are the, 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 the staff people and faculty people who are serving the ever-changing diversity of our students without even questioning their own personal biases and the changing dynamic of this affluent area of the Silicon Valley that this, uh, uh, you know, two, two versions of the Silicon Valley, there's extreme poverty and then there's extreme affluence without any concern because this is just the job to get through. So I, I, I applaud those who want to reach out and just kind of start those conversations. It is very difficult, we, it's courageous, but I think we all need to make that commitment because as you mentioned, if we don't, this, you might as well, forget. if you're worried about your job, you know, it's not going to be here if we don't keep our enrollment up keep our retention up, and these are the students that we serve. And I think I covered everything. I apologize. For nice job. Away. Thank you. I have uh, two questions that came from Dienza. Um, one being, as a white instructor, how do I let my Latino, whoa, come back here. Just a second, let me see if I can grab it. Latino and African American students know that I don't think they represent their entire ethnic group. That was one question. Another one is what does the revolution look like, feel like, and taste like? So, I don't know that there's any foolproof way that a, that a white person can convey that to people of color concretely in a very short time, I think. That's something that gets conveyed by relationship building, right? I think that when you build relationships with students across lines of difference, they get to know you and you get to know them and then they get to sense what you really think about them. No one coming in is gonna, you know, it's, it's bottom line, the first time that you're interacting with somebody, you got all that baggage comes in the room with you. So if your experience with dominant group educators hasn't been a positive one, 
that's going to be where you're starting. And, 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 and that's not the fault of that next educator, but we just have to be aware of it. So I think it's about relationship building, but there is one thing I think we can do. And I'm not saying it's foolproof, but I know that I've seen it work and I've counseled people to do it before in one form or another. Um, several years ago, a woman who I grew up with as kids, graduated high school with, she was 40 and we hadn't talked to each other in years, hits me up on Facebook, says, I'm starting a new career as a teacher. Um, she just got her teaching certification in New York City. She was gonna teach in the New York public schools where she'd been living for some years. Um, had never taught before, but got her cert at Hunter College and was gonna be turned loose in the NY, New York uh, public school system. So she says to me, given what you do, Tim, you know, what do I need to know? Now this is a, this is a white woman from the South, southern accent, blonde hair, blue-eyed, former cheerleader. I'm not saying any of this to be negative or hostile uh, on any of those categories. I'm just trying to set a visual for you for what is going to come. And I said, well, before I can tell you what I think you need to know, I need to know where you're going to be teaching. And she said, well, I'm going to be in the South Bronx. And I said, really? I don't know how much y'all know about the South Bronx. I said, uh, what neighborhood in the South Bronx, please? She says, Mott Haven. Yeah, see, a couple y'all know. <laughs> Mott Haven is the poorest neighborhood in the South Bronx. It's the second poorest community in the United States after Pine Ridge Reservation. Median household income in Mott Haven as of the early 2000s, about 7,500 a year per household income. And they're gonna turn this white woman who's never taught before loose in Mott Haven on eighth graders. Now, eighth grade is about the worst time to be alive. It's between that and seventh. Worst time to be on the planet, let alone if you're in a marginalized space economically and racially marginalized, which Mott Haven certainly is. And now this nice white lady is gonna roll up like Michelle Pfeiffer in that movie, Dangerous Minds, and is supposed to help you. And I said, I said, this is all I got for you. I said, honestly, first get a transit map because I know you hadn't been up there yet. That's number one. Uh, number one, make sure you get where you're going. Number two is I think you need to go in and, and convey that you see what they see when they look at you, right? You need to let them know that you know how ridiculous it is that they have sent you up there to be the quote unquote savior because that's what every one of them is going to think. I said, honest to God, Kristen, this is what I would do. I'd go in the first day, I'd go to the chalkboard, put my name on the board, turn around and go, I know this is some shit, right? <laughs> that's, what I, I, that's what I told her to say. I said, you should just say like, this is some real shit. And, because every, and then they'll laugh because every one of them is going to, they're already thinking it. They just need to know that you see the absurdity. And then I said, here's the next question. What do you think it means that they sent me, a totally inexperienced teacher, just started out to teach you? What does it say about how this system views you? And what does it say about how they view me? Because, because what it says about how they view y'all is that they don't care if you learn. Because if they really cared, they'd send the most experienced teacher in there to teach you. And they don't care whether I quit. Because if y'all decide to run me out because you don't like me, they'll get some other sucker from Hunter College to take the spot. Now, I'm not saying that exact same conversation has to happen in a community college context, although nothing works better than I know this is some shit. I will tell you, it's a very, it's a very effective phrase. But, but the real point is to, in, in your own way, try to convey that, you know, you don't have all the answers, right? That was really what I was trying to say to her. Yeah, she's the, she's the content specialist who's gonna teach English or whatever it was, but they've got wisdom and, and you need to elicit their wisdom. That's the job of the educator. And the only way, the only way you do that is by admitting you don't know some stuff, including the lives that they lead. And I think if you convey that, because I told my friend, I said, look, you're gonna try that and it's gonna get you somewhere, but you're still gonna have trouble because come on, first of all, they're eighth graders. They're gonna give you a hard time all throughout the year. That's the only power they got right, is to sort of mess with you a little bit. I said, but, and so you're gonna have, no matter how hard you try, you're gonna have folks for whom it's just not gonna click right away or in a short period, but I guarantee you keep coming back to that idea of we're co-learners here. I'm not just, I'm not doing what Brazilian educator Paulo Freire called banking model of education, where I'm just dumping, you know, where, where I'm making deposits into your brain and then I'm gonna make a withdrawal at, when it's test time. That's a banking model. That's not a liberation model of education. And so I think that's one way that a white educator can send that message is by being humble enough to admit all the stuff they don't know. Uh, and over time, I think that helps. Can I add um, to that, 
there's also the critical and self-conscious reflection on how do you know what you think you know. Um, and, and so often people will say, you know, so, so my group, um, we do consulting for higher education institutions and for clinicians, for um, healthcare um, folks. And um, so we'll say, so what you think you know, how did you get there? Whose voices informed what you think you know? And, and how do you know what you think you know is right? And then the other thing is that your proficiencies aren't static. Your equity competencies aren't like absorbed through the air. And it's not an issue of morality. If you do not know how to be clinically appropriate and culturally responsive, it's not because you're a horrible human being. It's because there are merit-based and knowledge-based and skill-based competencies. And you go seek those and you build your capacity in the same way that you would learn a language. You don't say, I don't know how to speak Spanish and so I must be a horrific human being. You say, huh, how do people learn this? They go out and they seek education, they seek exposure, they experiment, they talk to other people who know, they go and they're humble enough to admit what they don't know. And so one of the things that um, we say to faculty members all the time is build your skills. Build your skills, build your skills, build your skills, and then as, as a campus community, what are the opportunities you're providing to folks to build their skills? Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for being here. It's really uh, nice to see so many people on a beautiful Friday here um, sharing and being part of this conversation. Um, I just wanted to respond to the last um, comment as well, is that um, this need to have a kind of coordinated, I guess, um, beloved community, right? This kind of community where we have folks that are dealing with students at all different aspects of the, of the college structure, and really kind of putting forth um, an equitable attitude towards the students and, and the faculty and the staff, really to me is a foundational part of what we're trying to do. Now, Working as, as a sociology instructor uh, in the classroom, I really, I guess I took a, a different approach in the beginning, which was to really put forth a, a space to express that anger that we feel, right, as people of color, as women, uh, as queer folks. Um, and I felt like it didn't really have the same result that I wanted. And what I've started doing is putting forth a kind of beloved community building first, right, in the first two weeks of class. And I feel like that kind of builds the space for, I guess, working through that trauma, right? The trauma is where we can get into the real heart of the matter, right? Not so much the anger part. The anger part comes from the trauma, right? Thus, we have Trump voters, right? Does that make sense? <laughs> right? So the hurt is where it's at. So when you build a space where people can express their hurt in a calm environment, I think that's kind of where we can start building on this critical consciousness around race and having that conversation because we never get there if we start with the anger. Uh, thank you. And I would, if I could just say something real quick to that, yeah. I think it's also really important to, to give people the opportunity to reflect on what did it take for them to get into that room, right? I mean, what did it take? What does it take every day for them to be there, right? Because now we're not only talking about their hurt and their anger, which is huge and we need to process and give space for, we're also tapping into their resilience that gets them out of bed and gets them to come in spite of all that, in spite of all their hurt and anger, still puts their butt in that chair to have whatever conversation about whatever subject it is because they're committed to education. They need to also be thinking about that because that, that's a skill set. That resilience is a, is a skill set and some people all across the economic and racial spectrum sorely lack it. And other people have it in abundance. And I want those students to feel not only that they have been certainly harmed by the system, they need to know that, and that they have every right to be angry at the system, they need to know that, but that they also have some skills that don't get recognized enough in this society, mm -hmm. and one of them is that they don't give up in the face of that and they refuse to die. And that's an important thing that, that they need to be able to tap into as well and feel strong about. Go ahead. I just want to say one last thing. Um, we are having an event on May 5th, um, and I want to invite everybody here who's interested in this topic because it, um, it's an opportunity for students to, we're actually gonna have a panel of students called Student Voices, and it's happening on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. It's gonna happen from 1.30 till 4.30.
And we're going to have a panel of about six to eight students, and they're going to be answering questions about their struggle, exactly what you're just talking about, right? What does it take for them to, to get to school and to do well? But also, what can we do, right, as, as staff, as faculty, to make that process better? Yeah. And it, it's a both-way thing. They're going to say what, sincerely what they think, and we're going to say sincerely what we think. And then we can start to reach some conclusions. So this is kind of a, uh, an event where we're going to kind of show it how it's done and kind of see if we can reproduce it throughout the campus. That's so I invite everybody, um, CHC, California History, building over at De Anza College. Thank you. Cool. So I resonate so much with the empathy and care that is resonating from what you're saying about your work with students. And so the one, um, the, the one challenge and pushback that I would um, present, and, and with really a great amount of respect, is, that, um, is the challenge to renegotiate our relationship with anger. Um, because in, in the USN culture, we're not so great at disconnecting anger with violence and disconnecting anger with destruction. And so then we start talking about strategies to not be angry. And with a lot of the conditions that people are experiencing, it would kind of be crazy not to be angry. It's then when students or we experience anger and we don't know how to transform anger into more productive actions that then we have to pay the price for, then, we, then it's not useful to us and it doesn't serve us. So my, my only, the, the main motivation I have for, for just challenging that language, and again, I say it because I'm really confident that I'm resonating with the heart of what you're saying and have great respect for what you're saying. Um, sometimes it's flipped to the folks who are experiencing the anger, and so there's an expectation that we'll behave if we're angry. And that, why are you coming at the, you know, why are you being the angry fill in the blank again? And, and so, um, again, what's the function of that? And so I just really encourage us to consider if maybe the challenge when we're working with folks who are really angry Maybe the challenge is being able to create an environment where we can hold the anger and then say, how do you process through it and transform it into something that's useful for you, rather than something that you are going to then have to pay the cost for. And that's a really, that, that's a pretty sophisticated conversation. Um, it, it's something that has helped me in my work with students and my work with clinicians as well. Um, I was talking with Tim last night about a conversation with a clinician who was saying, you know, my goal is to help this young black man in this community in Portland not be angry. I'm like, you're not going to be do able to do successful clinical work with this person if you're asking him to negotiate his relationship with anger through your fear of anger. Because his lived experience makes it really, really rational for him to be angry at this point. So how do you help him develop skills and strategies to transform that into an action that then doesn't become part of his permanent educational record, doesn't become this treatment diagnosis, that doesn't follow him around forever? I mean, so how do you disconnect that with violence and destruction in his life? That's a different challenge. Oh, hi. Uh, oh, wait. Was I was going to contribute something different. Please. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Amy Cesara. I'm a faculty in, uh, at De Anza in English Language Arts. Um, just to kind of go back to a little bit of, of what we talked about in our group, um, the first thing that seemed to resonate among my group was around the word discomfort or uh, the question that was posed about um, feeling comfortable to deal with these issues. And we seem to have a resounding sense around that it's not just about comfort or discomfort, but often about safety. And so we, we were kind of talking about what that means, you know, in situations in which we might feel we're, we're separated or siloed among, depending on who we are, what our experiences have been. And so um, that was one thing to name is around safety. And that then having the dialogues that need to happen among faculty, but then now I'm, I want to add among faculty and students that um, provide enough uh, room to deal with the consequences of breaking through silos or breaking through uh, speaking things that maybe haven't been spoken. Um, so that was one, and then now I'm gonna elaborate a little bit on, on my own 
comment that um, I put up there, which um, is related to that, is sort of what's come up, come up, comes up for me a lot as an educator um, who's been in classrooms for a long time, but um, only now at De Anza seeing sort of, well, I've taught at a, at a couple districts where I didn't see my own face in the classroom, and this is one of those rare and powerful opportunities where I do. And in fact, what happens is, I think, especially with the, with the election season that happened, and I was very new to the campus, um, you know, my embodiedness as an educator, my, myself as a woman of color who is an immigrant, uh, of an immigrant family, and sort of, you know, having to sort of struggle with how do I be in leadership while I'm also going through my own triggers and own, like, perhaps similar things that a lot of the students are having. So I think part of my commitment was, you know, engaging in those dialogues despite discomfort, um, how, how we as, and we all know that women of color educators a lot of times face different challenges um, than, than others and that um, a lot of times we have to deal with the burden of representation. I've had to deal with that in many places I've taught where I often feel like, you know, the material I'm teaching is seen as, oh, that's your bone to pick, that's your issue, and if the students have some skepticism. But now, how can I channel sort of the empathy I might be feeling with my students um, and into um, you know, collective empowerment, creating that beloved community, creating um, collective learning, and finding that balance of being humbled but also holding the space and being empowered myself. Um, so part of my commitment was sort of like continue to have that, I would say, bravery and courage in the classroom, but also among my faculty, among you know, engage in dialogues and, and bringing back to full circle to what my group was feeling was, was seeking out and, and encouraging those dialogues where we can perhaps take our hats off or our roles and really, you know, take risks in engaging and listening to one another. I think, I think that last part, I mean, it's all important what you said, but that last part about having an opportunity to take off that hat as an educator, which is to say really, as a content specialist in whatever it is you teach. If you, you know, you teach something, you teach it because you're a content specialist, you have a certain specialized knowledge, and so there's expertise there, and that's great. But um, just like you don't know everything there is to know about your subject, even though you teach it, and that's why you do continuing education, and that's why you continue to read things in your field, hopefully. Um, there's definitely stuff outside of your immediate field that you don't know, and I think part of conveying and bu conveying, building relationships and community amongst each other uh, within the, a certain job complex or um, building community with students and the larger sense of the community is about conveying that dual reality of yes, I've got some specialized skills, but as much as I know, there's a lot of other stuff I don't know and need to learn about myself and about the things that cause me pain and trigger me and, and and trigger certain emotional reactions in me. And I need to know that in order to be able to work with you. Because if I don't know what gets me going and gets me uptight and gets me scared and gets me off my game, because we all have those days that, as educators, in that broad sense, when we're not on our game, you know, when we just sort of like come in and we just weren't, we don't think we conveyed what we wanted to convey to the students. Or I give a talk and I don't feel like I conveyed what I want, and it could be because I didn't get enough sleep or I ate something that you know gave me indigestion or whatever it is. I gotta be humble enough to sort of own that. And so I think the more that we can drop that veil of objectivity with each other and, and acknowledge our own inadequacies, even as people who have a real vested interest, don't we, as professionals, in saying, I know my stuff, by God. I know what I'm doing. None of us wants to admit that there's some things that maybe we, we don't know how to do. You don't want to give up that control. You don't want to give it up in the classroom because that seems chaotic. You don't want to give up, give it up with other faculty because we're in a society that likes to compare us to each other. So like if I admit my weakness and you won't, oh my God, what have I just done? I've just, I've just made myself vulnerable. Well, you have to be willing to make yourself vulnerable if you're going to learn and, and, and because learning is about acknowledging there's things you don't know. So, and, and so if you're not willing to be vulnerable, then you're not willing to learn, then you're not willing to grow, then you can't help others grow. And this is sort of basic human development stuff, but really, really important. So I think to create those spaces, and I don't like the term safe just because to me, I don't think there's no such thing as a fully safe space 
in a society of inequality, right? In a society of racial inequity, of, of white supremacy, frankly, I don't think people of color are ever fully safe until that system is gone. In a system of patriarchy, I don't think women are ever fully safe until that system is gone. In a system of straight supremacy and cisgendered supremacy, I don't think LGBTQ folk are ever safe until that system is gone. Can we make it safer? Uh, yeah, but I, I'm primarily concerned about making it equitable. And if making it equitable and just requires some discomfort and, and some emotional unsafety in the sense that I gotta really struggle. Physical safety is assumed. Like I, we were talking yesterday, I said, I've done this for almost a quarter century. No one's ever brought a knife to the workshop, you know? No one's ever pulled a weapon and threatened to hurt anyone in the workshop. So we, we're gonna assume physical safety to have these conversations. I'm not sure that we should assume complete emotional safety. I think we should be prepared to be vulnerable because it sort of goes back to something someone else said. If, if, if we're not willing to be brave and courageous because we're afraid what it's gonna to do to us professionally, trust that if we're not brave and courageous, there won't be a job in the long run or an institution with which to work. Bravery and courage are, are not sort of luxuries in, anymore. We have, to, we have to do them as necessities. Thank you. Um, we've come to the end of um, our conversation this morning. It um, feels like a really productive conversation. Um, thank you for your earnest engagement. Um, Tim, you'll be available for, um, for a book signing. Um, and that's just right outside. And um, is there anything else you'd like to say, Pat, in, in closing? Thank you for, thank you. Thank you for coming.